Mrs. Tiggy Winkle by Beatrix Potter of Dramatic Reading Scene and Story Collection, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrator, read by Beeswax Candle. Lucy, read by Marie Christian. Mrs. Tiggywinkle, read by Agnes Robert Bear. Speckled Hen, read by Victoria Bell. Once upon a time, there was a little girl called Lucy, who lived at a farm called Little Town. She was a good little girl, only she was always losing her pocket handkerchiefs. One day, little Lucy came into the farmyard crying. Oh, she did cry so. I've lost my pocket handkin. Three handkins and a penny. Have you seen them, Tabby Kitten? The kitten went on washing her white paws. So Lucy asked a speckled hen. Sally Henny Penny, have you found three pocket handkins? But the speckled hen ran into a barn clucking. I go barefoot, barefoot, barefoot. And then Lucy asked Cock Robin sitting on a twig. Cock Robin looked sideways at Lucy with his bright black eye, and he flew over a stile and away. Lucy climbed upon the stile and looked up at the hill behind Little Town, a hill that goes up, up into the clouds as though it had no top. And a great way up the hillside, she thought she saw some white things spread upon the grass. Lucy scrambled up the hill as fast as her stout legs would carry her, and she ran along a steep pathway, up and up, until Little Town was right away down below. She could have dropped a pebble down the chimney. Presently, she came to a spring, bubbling out from the hillside. Someone had stood a tin can upon a stone to catch the water, but the water was already running over, for the can was no bigger than an egg cup, and where the sand upon the path was wet, there were footmarks of a very small person. Lucy ran on and on. The path ended under a big rock. The grass was short and green, and there were clothes props cut from bracken stems with lines of plaited rushes and a heap of tiny clothespins, but no pocket handkerchiefs. But there was something else. A door, straight into the hill, and inside it, someone was singing. Lily white and clean, oh. With little frills between, oh, smooth and hot red rusty spot, never here be seen, oh. Lucy knocked once, twice, and interrupted the song. A little frightened voice called out, Who was that? Lucy opened the door, and what do you think was inside the hill? A nice clean kitchen, with a flagged floor and wooden beams, just like any other farm kitchen. Only the ceiling was so low that Lucy's head nearly touched it, and the pots and pans were small, and so was everything there. There was a nice hot singy smell, and at the table, with an iron in her hand, stood a very stout short person staring anxiously at Lucy. Her print gown was tucked up, and she was wearing a large apron over her striped petticoat. Her little black nose went sniffle, sniffle, snuffle, and her eyes went twinkle, twinkle. And underneath her cap, where Lucy had yellow curls, that little person had prickles. Who are you? said Lucy. Have you seen my pocket handkins? The little person made a bob curtsy. Oh, yes, if you please em. My name is Mrs. Tiggywinkle. Oh, yes, if you please em. I am an excellent clear starcher. And she took something out of a clothes basket and spread it on the ironing blanket. What's that thing? said Lucy. That's not my pocket handkin. Oh, no, if you please em. That's a little scarlet waistcoat belonging to Cock Robin. And she ironed it and folded it and put it on one side. Then she took something else off a clothes horse. That isn't my penny said Lucy. Oh, no, if you please em. That's a damask tablecloth belonging to Jenny Wren. 
Look how it's stained with currant wine. It's very bad to wash, said Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. Mrs. Tiggy Winkle's nose went sniffle, sniffle, snuffle, and her eyes went twinkle, twinkle, and she fetched another hot iron from the fire. There's one of my pocket handkins, cried Lucy. And there's my penny. Mrs. Tiggy Winkle ironed it and goffered it and shook out the frills. Oh, that is lovely, said Lucy. And what are those long yellow things with fingers like gloves? Oh, that's a pair of stockings belonging to Sally Henny Penny. Look how she's worn the heels out with scratching in the yard. She'll very soon go barefoot, said Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. Why, there's another handkersniff, but it isn't mine. It's red. Oh, no, if you please them. That one belongs to old Mrs. Rabbit. It did so smell of onions. I've had to wash it separately. I can't get out the smell. There's another one of mine, said Lucy. What are those funny little white things? That's a pair of mittens, belonging to Tabby Kitten. I only have to iron them. She washes them herself. There's my last pocket handkin, said Lucy. And what are you dipping into the basin of starch? They're little dicky shirt fronts belonging to Tom Titmouse. Most terrible particular, said Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. Now I've finished my ironing. I'm going to air some clothes. What are these dear soft fluffy things? said Lucy. Oh, those are woolly coats belonging to the little lambs at Skelgill. Will their jackets take off? asked Lucy. Oh, yes, if you please them. Look at the sheep mark on the shoulder. And here's one marked for Gadesgar. And three that come from Littletown. They're always marked at washing, said Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. And she hung up all sorts and sizes of clothes, small brown coats of mice, and one velvety black moleskin waistcoat, and a red tailcoat with no tail belonging to Squirrel Nutkin, and a very much shrunk blue jacket belonging to Peter Rabbit, and a petticoat, not marked, that had gone lost in the washing. And at last the basket was empty. Then Mrs. Tiggy Winkle made tea, a cup for herself and a cup for Lucy. They sat before the fire on a bench and looked sideways at one another. Mrs. Tiggy Winkle's hand, holding the teacup, was very, very brown and very, very wrinkly with the soap suds. And all through her gown and her cap, there were hairpins sticking wrong end out, so that Lucy didn't like to sit too near her. When they had finished tea, they tied up the clothes and bundles, and Lucy's pocket handkerchiefs were folded up inside her clean penny and fastened with a silver safety pin. And then they made up the fire with turf, and came out and locked the door, and hid the key under the door sill. Then away down the hill trotted Lucy and Mrs. Tiggy Winkle with the bundles of clothes. All the way down the path, little animals came out of the fern to meet them. The very first that they met were Peter Rabbit and Benjamin Bunny. And she gave them their nice clean clothes, and all the little animals and birds were so very much obliged to dear Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. So that at the bottom of the hill, when they came to the stile, there was nothing left to carry except Lucy's one little bundle. Lucy scrambled up the stile with the bundle in her hand, and then she turned to say, Good night, and to thank the washerwoman. But what a very odd thing. Mrs. Tiggy Winkle had not waited either for thanks or for the washing bill. She was running, running, running up the hill. And where was her white frilled cap and her shawl and her gown and her petticoat? And how small she had grown. And how brown and covered with prickles. Why, Mrs. Tiggy Winkle was nothing but a hedgehog. End of Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. Madame Bovary, Part Three, Chapter One, by Gustave Flaubert, translated by Eleanor Marks Aveling, of Dramatic Reading Scene and Story Collection, Volume Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Characters Leon Dupuis, read by Claudia Caldi. Emma Bovary, read by Jen Broda. The Beagle, 
Read by Alan Mapstone. The Coachman. Read by Inko. Servant. Read by Inko. Narrator. Read by Beeswax Candle. Monsieur Léon, while studying law, had gone pretty often to the dancing rooms, where he was even a great success amongst the grisettes, who thought he had a distinguished air. He was the best mannered of the students. He wore his hair neither too long nor too short, didn't spend all his quarter's money on the first day of the month, and kept on good terms with his professors. As for excesses, he had always abstained from them, as much from cowardice as from refinement. Often, when he stayed in his room to read, or else when sitting of an evening under the lime trees of the Luxembourg, he let his code fall to the ground, and the memory of Emma came back to him. But gradually this feeling grew weaker, and other desires gathered over it, although it still persisted through them all. For Leon did not lose all hope. There was for him, as it were, a vague promise floating in the future, like a golden fruit suspended from some fantastic tree. Then, seeing her again after three years of absence, his passion reawakened. He must, he thought, at last make up his mind to possess her. Moreover, his timidity had worn off by contact with his gay companions, and he returned to the provinces, despising everyone who had not, with varnished shoes, trodden the asphalt of the boulevards. By the side of a Parisienne in her laces, in the drawing-room of some illustrious physician, a person driving his carriage, wearing many orders, the poor clerk would no doubt have trembled like a child. But here, at Rouen, on the harbour, with the wife of this small doctor, he felt at ease. Sure beforehand he would shine. Self-possession depends on its environment. We don't speak on the first floor as on the fourth, and the wealthy woman seems to have about her to guard her virtue all her banknotes, like a cuirass in the lining of her corset. On leaving the Bavaries the night before, Léon had followed them through the streets at a distance. Then, having seen them stop at the Croix Rouge, he turned on his heel and spent the night meditating a plan. So the next day, about five o'clock, he walked into the kitchen of the inn with a choking sensation in his throat, pale cheeks, and that resolution of cowards that stops at nothing. The gentleman isn't in, answered a servant. This seemed to him a good omen. He went upstairs. She was not disturbed at his approach. On the contrary, she apologised for having neglected to tell him where they were staying. Oh, I divined it, said Léon. He pretended he had been guided towards her by chance, by instinct. She began to smile. And at once, to repair his folly, Léon told her that he had spent his morning in looking for her in all the hotels in the town, one after the other. So you have made up your mind to stay? He added. Yes, she said. And I am wrong. One ought not to accustom oneself to impossible pleasures when there are a thousand demands upon one. Oh, I can't imagine. Ah, no. For you, you are a man. But men, too, had had their trials, and the conversation went off into certain philosophical reflections. Emma expatiated much on the misery of earthly affections, and the eternal isolation in which the heart remains entombed. To show off, or from a naive imitation of this melancholy which called forth his, the young man declared that he had been awfully bored during the whole course of his studies. The law irritated him, other vocations attracted him, and his mother never ceased worrying him in every one of her letters. As they talked, they explained more and more fully the motives of their sadness, working themselves up in their progressive confidence. But they sometimes stopped short of the complete exposition of their thought, and then sought to invent a phrase that might express it all the same. She did not confess her passion for another. He did not say that he had forgotten her. Perhaps he no longer remembered his suppers with girls after masked balls, and no doubt she did not recollect the rendezvous of old when she ran across the fields in the morning to her lover's house. 
The noises of the town hardly reached them, and the room seemed small, as if on purpose to hem in their solitude more closely. Emma, in a dimity dressing gown, leant her head against the back of the old armchair. The yellow wallpaper formed, as it were, a golden background behind her, and her bare head was mirrored in the glass with the white parting in the middle, and the tip of her ears peeping out from the folds of her hair. But pardon me, she said. It is wrong of me. I weary you with my eternal complaints. No, never, never. If you knew... She went on, raising to the ceiling her beautiful eyes, in which a tear was trembling. All that I had dreamed. And I, oh, I too have suffered. Often I went out, I went away. I dragged myself along the quays, seeking distraction amid the din of the crowd, without being able to banish the heaviness that weighed upon me. In an engraver's shop on the boulevard, there is an Italian print of one of the muses. She is draped in a tunic, and she is looking at the moon with forget-me-nots in her flowing hair. Something drove me there continually. I stayed there hours together. Then, in a trembling voice... She resembled you a little. Madame Bovary turned away her head that he might not see the irrepressible smile she felt rising to her lips. Often, he went on, I wrote you letters that I tore up. She did not answer, he continued. I sometimes fancied that some chance would bring you. I thought I recognized you as street corners, and I ran after all the carriages through whose windows I saw a shawl flattering a veil like yours. She seemed resolved to let him go on speaking without interruption. Crossing her arms and bending down her face, she looked at the rosettes on her slippers, and at intervals made little movements inside the satin of them with her toes. At last she sighed. But the most wretched thing, is it not? is to drag out, as I do, a useless existence. If our pains were only of some use to someone, we should find consolation in the thought of the sacrifice. He started off in praise of virtue, duty, and silent immolation, having himself an incredible longing for self-sacrifice that he could not satisfy. I should much like, she said, to be a nurse at a hospital. Alas, men have none of these holy missions, and they see nowhere any calling, unless perhaps that of a doctor. With a slight shrug of her shoulders, Emma interrupted him to speak of her illness, which had almost killed her. What a pity! She should not be suffering now. Leon at once envied the calm of the tomb, and one evening he had even made his will, asking to be buried in that beautiful rug with velvet stripes he had received from her. For this was how they would have wished to be, each setting up an ideal to which they were now adapting their past life. Besides, speech is a rolling mill that always thins out the sentiment. But at this invention of the rug, she asked, But why? Why? He hesitated. Because I loved you so. And congratulating himself at having surmounted the difficulty, Léon watched her face out of the corner of his eyes. It was like the sky when a gust of wind drives the clouds across. The mass of sad thoughts that darkened them seemed to be lifted from her blue eyes. Her whole face shone. He waited. At last she replied. I always suspected it. Then they went over all the trifling events of that far-off existence, whose joys and sorrows they had just summed up in one word. They recalled the arbour with Clematis, the dresses she had worn, the furniture of her room, the whole of her house. And now our poor cactuses, where are they? The cold killed them this winter. Ah, how I have thought of them, do you know? I often saw them again as of yore, when on the summer mornings the sun bit down upon your blinds, and they saw your two bare arms passing out amongst the flowers. Poor friend, she said, holding out her hand to him. Léon swiftly pressed his lips to it. Then, when he had taken a deep breath, At that time you were to me, I know not, what incomprehensible force that took captive my life. 
Once, for instance, I went to see you, but you, no doubt, do not remember it. I do, she said. Go on. You were downstairs in the anteroom, ready to go out, standing on the last stair. You were wearing a bonnet with small blue flowers, and without an invitation from you, in spite of myself, I went with you. Every moment, however, I grew more and more conscious of my folly, and I went on walking by you, not daring to follow you completely, and unwilling to leave you. When you went into a shop, I waited in the street, and I watched you through the window, taking off your gloves and counting the change on the counter. Then you rang at Madame Tufache's. You were let in, and I stood like an idiot in front of the great heavy door that had closed after you. Madame Bovary, as she listened to him, wondered that she was so old. All these things reappearing before her seemed to widen out her life. It was like some sentimental immensity to which she returned. And from time to time, she said in a low voice, her eyes half closed. Yes, it is true, true, true. They heard eight strike on the different clocks of the Beauvoisin quarter, which was full of schools, churches and large empty hotels. They no longer spoke, but felt as they looked upon each other a buzzing in their heads, as if something sonorous had escaped from the fixed eyes of each of them. They were hand in hand now, and the past, the future, reminiscences and dreams, were all confounded in the sweetness of this ecstasy. Night was darkening over the walls, on which still shone, half hidden in the shade, the coarse colours of four bills representing four scenes from the Tour de Nestle, with a motto in Spanish and French at the bottom. Through the sash window, a patch of dark sky was seen between the pointed roofs. She rose to light two wax candles on the drawers. Then she sat down again. Well, said Léon. Well, she replied. He was thinking how to resume the interrupted conversation, when she said to him, How is it that no one until now has ever expressed such sentiments to me? The clerk said that ideal natures were difficult to understand. He, from the first moment, had loved her, and he despaired when he thought of the happiness that would have been theirs if, thanks to fortune, meeting her earlier, they had been indissolubly bound to one another. I have sometimes thought of it, she went on. What a dream, murmured Léon, and fingering gently the blue binding of her long white sash, he added, And who prevents us from beginning now? No, my friend, she replied. I am too old. You are too young. Forget me. Others will love you. You will love them. Not as you, he cried. What a child you are. Come, let us be sensible. I wish it. She showed him the impossibility of their love that they must remain, as formerly, on the simple terms of a fraternal friendship. Was she speaking thus seriously? No doubt Emma did not herself know, quite absorbed as she was by the charm of the seduction, and the necessity of defending herself from it. And contemplating the young man with a moved look, she gently repulsed the timid caresses that his trembling hands attempted. Ah, forgive me he cried, drawing back. Emma was seized with a vague fear at this shyness, more dangerous to her than the boldness of Rodolphe when he advanced to her open-armed. No man had ever seemed to her so beautiful. An exquisite candour emanated from his being. He lowered his long, fine eyelashes that curled upwards. His cheek, with the soft skin reddened, she thought, with desire of her person. And Emma, felt an invincible longing to press her lips to it. Then, leaning towards the clock as if to see the time, Ah, how late it is, she said. How we do chatter. He understood the hint and took up his hat. It has even made me forget the theatre, and poor Bovary has left me here especially for that. 
Monsieur Lormont of the Rue Grand Pont was to take me and his wife. And the opportunity was lost, as she was to leave the next day. Really? said Léon. Yes. But I must see you again, he went on. I wanted to tell you... What? Something important, serious. Oh no, besides, you will not go. It is impossible. If you should listen to me, then you have not understood me, you have not guessed. Yet you speak plainly, said Emma. Ah, you can jest. Enough, enough. Oh, for pity's sake, let me see you once, only once. Well? She stopped. Then, as if thinking better of it. Oh, not here. Where you will. Will you? She seemed to reflect. Then abruptly. Tomorrow, at eleven o'clock in the cathedral. I shall be there. He cried, seizing her hands, which she disengaged. And as they were both standing up, he behind her and Emma with her head bent, he stooped over her and pressed long kisses on her neck. You are mad. Ah, oh, you are mad. She said with sounding little laughs while the kisses multiplied. Then bending his head over her shoulder, he seemed to beg the consent of her eyes. They fell upon him full of an icy dignity. Léon stepped back to go out. He stopped on the threshold. Then he whispered with a trembling voice. Tomorrow. She answered with a nod and disappeared like a bird into the next room. In the evening, Emma wrote the clerk in an interminable letter in which she cancelled the rendezvous. All was over. They must not, for the sake of their happiness, meet again. But when the letter was finished, as she did not know Léon's address, she was puzzled. I'll give it to him myself, she said. He will come. The next morning, at the open window and humming on his balcony, Léon himself varnished his pumps with several coatings. He put on white trousers, fine socks, a green coat, emptied all the scent he had into his handkerchief, then having had his hair curled, he uncurled it again, in order to give it a more natural elegance. It is still too early, he thought, looking at the hairdresser's cuckoo clock that pointed to the hour of nine. He read an old-fashioned journal, went out, smoked a cigar, walked up three streets, thought it was time, and went slowly towards the porch of Notre Dame. It was a beautiful summer morning. Silver plates sparkled in the jeweller's windows, and the light falling obliquely on the cathedral made mirrors of the corners of the grey stones. A flock of birds fluttered in the grey sky round the trefoil bell turrets. The square, resounding with cries, was fragrant with the flowers that bordered its pavement. Roses, jasmines, pinks, narcissi, and tuberoses. Unevenly spaced out between moist grasses, catmint, and chickweed for the birds. The fountains gurgled in the centre and under large umbrellas amidst melons piled up in heaps, flower women, bareheaded, were twisting paper round bunches of violets. The young man took one. It was the first time that he had bought flowers for a woman, and his breast as he smelt them swelled with pride, as if this homage that he meant for another had recoiled upon himself. But he was afraid of being seen. He resolutely entered the church. The beadle, who was just then standing on the threshold in the middle of the left doorway, under the dancing Marianne, with feather cap and rapier dangling against his calves, came in, more majestic than a cardinal, and as shining as a saint on a holy pyx. He came towards Lyon, and with that smile of wheedling benignity assumed by ecclesiastics when they question children, The gentleman, no doubt, does not belong to these parts. The gentleman would like to see the curiosities of the church? No, said the other. At first he went round the lower aisles. Then he went out to look at the plus. Emma was not coming yet. He went up again to the choir. The nave was reflected in the full fonts 
with the beginning of the arches and some portions of the glass windows. But the reflections of the paintings, broken by the marble rim, were continued farther upon the flagstones, like a many-coloured carpet. The broad daylight from without streamed into the church in three enormous rays from the three opened portals. From time to time at the upper end a sacristan passed, making the oblique genuflection of devout persons in a hurry. The crystal lustres hung motionless. In the choir a silver lamp was burning, and from the side chapels and dark places of the church sometimes rose sounds like sighs, with the clang of a closing grating, its echo reverberating under the lofty vault. Léon, with solemn steps, walked along by the walls. Life had never seemed so good to him. She would come directly, charming, agitated, looking back at the glances that followed her, with her flounced dress, her gold eyeglass, her thin shoes, with all sorts of elegant trifles that he had never enjoyed, and with the ineffable seduction of yielding virtue. The church, like a huge boudoir, spread around her. The arches bent down to gather in the shade the confession of her love. The windows shone resplendent to illumine her face, and the senses would burn that she might appear like an angel amid the fumes of the sweet-smelling odours. But she did not come. He sat down on a chair, and his eyes fell upon a blue stained window representing boatmen carrying baskets. He looked at it long, attentively, and he counted the scales of the fishes and the buttonholes of the doublets, while his thoughts wandered off towards Emma. The beadle, standing aloof, was inwardly angry at this individual who took the liberty of admiring the cathedral by himself. He seemed to him to be conducting himself in a monstrous fashion, to be robbing him in a sort, and almost committing sacrilege. But a rustle of silk on the flags, the tip of a bonnet, a lined cloak. It was she. Léon rose and ran to meet her. Emma was pale. She walked fast. Read, she said, holding out a paper to him. Oh, no. And she abruptly withdrew her hand to enter the chapel of the Virgin where, kneeling on a chair, she began to pray. The young man was irritated at this bigot fancy, that he nevertheless experienced a certain charm in seeing her in the middle of a rendezvous, thus lost in her devotions, like an Andalusian marchioness. Then he grew bored, for she seemed never coming to an end. Emma prayed, or rather strove to pray, hoping that some sudden resolution might descend to her from heaven, and to draw down divine aid, she filled full her eyes with the splendours of the tabernacle. She breathed in the perfumes of the full-blown flowers in the large vases, and listened to the stillness of the church that only heightened the tumult of her heart. She rose, and they were about to leave, when the beadle came forward hurriedly, saying, Madame, no doubt, does not belong to these parts? Madame would like to see the curiosities of the church? Oh, no, cried the clerk. Why not? said she, for she clung with her expiring virtue to the virgin, the sculptures, the tombs, anything. Then, in order to proceed by rule, the beadle conducted them right to the entrance near the square, where, pointing out with his cane, a large circle of block stones without inscription or carving. This, he said majestically, is the circumference of the beautiful bell of Ambrose. It weighed forty thousand pounds. There was not its equal in all Europe. The workman who cast it died of the joy. Let us go on, said Léon. The old fellow started off again. Then, having got back to the chapel of the Virgin, he stretched forth his arm with an all-embracing gesture of demonstration, and prouder than a country squire showing you his hispaliers, went on. This simple stone covers Pierre de Bres, Lord of Varennes and of Brissac, Grand Marshal of Poitou, and Governor of Normandy. 
who died at the Battle of Montelier on the 16th of July, 1465. Leon bit his lips, fuming. And on the right, this gentleman, all encased in iron, on the prancing horse, is his grandson, Louis de Brais, Lord of Breval and of Montchauvet, Comte de Molevrier, Baron de Monet, Chamberlain to the King, Knight of the Order, and also Governor of Normandy, died on the 23rd of July, 1531, a Sunday, as the inscription specifies, and below this figure, about to descend into the tomb, portrays the same person. It is not possible, is it, to see a more perfect representation of annihilation? Madame Bovary put up her eyeglasses. Léon, motionless, looked at her, no longer even attempting to speak a single word, to make a gesture. So discouraged was he at this twofold obstinacy of gossip and indifference. The everlasting guide went on. Near him, this kneeling woman who weeps is his spouse, Diane de Poitiers, Comtesse de Braise, Duchesse de Valentinois, born in 1499, died in 1566, and on the left, to the one with the child, is the Holy Virgin. Now turn to this side, here are the tombs of the Ambroise. They were both cardinals and archbishops of Rouen. That one was minister under Louis Douzième. He did a great deal for the cathedral. In his will he left thirty thousand gold crowns for the poor. And without stopping, still talking, he pushed them into a chapel full of balustrades, some put away, and disclosed a kind of block that certainly might once have been an ill-made statue. "'Truly,' he said with a groan, "'it adorned the tomb of Richard Coeur de Lyon, "'King of England and the Duke of Normandy. "'It was the Calvinists, sir, who reduced it to this condition. "'They had buried it for spite in the earth "'under the episcopal seat of Monsignor. "'See?' This is the door by which Monsignor passes to his house. Let us pass on quickly to see the gargoyle windows. But Léon hastily took some silver from his pocket and seized Emma's arm. The beadle stood dumbfounded, not able to understand this untimely munificence when there were still so many things for the stranger to see. So calling him back, he cried, Sir, sir, the steeple, the steeple. No, thank you, said Léon. You are wrong, sir. It is 440 feet high, nine less than the great pyramid of Egypt. It is all carted. Léon was fleeing, for it seemed to him that his love, that for nearly two hours now had become petrified in the church like the stones, would vanish like a vapour through that sort of truncated funnel of oblong cage, of open chimney that rises so grotesquely from the cathedral, like the extravagant attempt of some fantastic brazier. But where are we going? she said. Making no answer, he walked on with a rapid step, and Madame Bovary was already dipping her finger in the holy water, when behind them they heard a panting breath, interrupted by the regular sound of a cane. Léon turned back. Sir! What is it? And he recognised the beadle, holding under his arms and balancing against his stomach some twenty large sewn volumes. They were works, 
which treated of the cathedral. Idiot, growled Lerel, rushing out of the church. A lad was playing about the close. Go and get me a cup. The child bounded off like a ball by the Rue Quatrevins. Then they were alone a few minutes, face to face, and a little embarrassed. Ah, oh, Leon, really, I don't know if I ought, she whispered. Then with a more serious air. Do you know, it is very improper. How so? replied the clerk. It is done at Paris. And that, as an irresistible argument, decided her. Still the cab did not come. Léon was afraid she might go back into the church. At last the cab appeared. At all events, go out by the north porch, cried the beadle, who was left alone on the threshold. So as to see the resurrection, the last judgment, paradise, King David, and the condemned in hell flames. Where to, sir? asked the coachman. Where you like, said Léon, forcing Emma into the cab. And the lumbering machine set out. It went down the Rue Grand Pont, crossed the Place des Arts, the Quai Napoleon, the Pont Neuf, and stopped short before the statue of Pierre Cornet. Go on, cried a voice that came from within. The cab went on again, and as soon as it reached the Carrefour Lafayette, set off downhill and entered the station at a gallop. Nor straight on, cried the same voice. The cab came out by the gate, and soon having reached the cour, trotted quietly beneath the elm trees. The coachman wiped his brow, put his leather hat between his knees, and drove his carriage beyond the side alley by the meadow to the margin of the waters. It went along by the river, along the towing path paved with sharp pebbles, and for a long while in the direction of Oiselle, beyond the isles. But suddenly it turned with a dash across Quatre Mers, Sauteville, La Grande Chaussée, Le Rue d'Elbeuf, and made its third halt in front of the Jardin des Plantes. Get on, will you? cried the voice more furiously. And at once, resuming its course, it passed by saint Sever, by the Quai des Corandiers, the Quai aux Mules, once more over the bridge by the Place du Champ de Mars, and behind the hospital gardens, where old men in black coats were walking in the sun along the terrace all green with ivy. Went up the Boulevard Beauvreuil, along the Boulevard Cauchoise, and then the whole of Mont Rebudet to the Deville Hills. It came back, and then, without any fixed plan or direction, wandered about at hazard. The cab was seen at Saint-Paul, at Lescure, at Montgagin, at La Rouge Marc, and Place du Gaillard Bois, in the Rue Maladrière, Rue de Nadier, before Saint-Romain, Saint-Vivien, Saint-Maclou, saint Nequès, in front of the customs, at the Vieux Tour, the trois Pipes, and the Monumental Cemetery. From time to time, the coachman on his box cast despairing eyes at the public houses. He could not understand what furious desire for locomotion urged these individuals never to wish to stop. He tried to, now and then, and at once exclamations of anger burst forth behind him. He lashed his perspiring jades afresh, but indifferent to their jolting, running up against things here and there, not caring if he did, demoralised, and almost weeping with thirst, fatigue, and depression. And on the harbour, in the midst of the drays and casks, and in the streets, at the corners, the good folk opened large, wonder-stricken eyes at this sight, so extraordinary in the provinces, a cab with blinds drawn, and which appeared thus constantly shut more closely than a tomb, and tossing about like a vessel. Once in the middle of the day, in the open country, just as the sun beat most fiercely against the old plated lanterns, a bared hand passed beneath the small blinds of yellow canvas and threw out some scraps of paper that scattered in the wind and farther off lighted like white butterflies on a field of red clover, all in bloom. At about six o'clock, the carriage stopped in a back street of the Beauvoisine quarter, and a woman got out, who walked with her veil down, and without turning her head. 
End of Madame Bovary, Part 3, Chapter 1. Chapters 40 and 41 of Anne of the Island by L. M. Montgomery for Dramatic Reading Scene and Story Collection, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Cast Narrator Read by Anne Fletcher Charlotta the Fourth Read by Booker and 360 Marilla Cuthbert Read by Agnes Robert Bear Anne Shirley Read by Nora Nelson Davy Keith Read by Lynette Calkins Mrs. Rachel Lind Read by Victoria Bell Pacifique Ruata Read by Brian Fulham Gilbert Blythe Read by Keith Salas Chapter 40 A Book of Revelation The Irvings came back to Echo Lodge for the summer, and Anne spent a happy three weeks there in July. Miss Lavender had not changed. Charlotta the Fourth was a very grown-up young lady now, but still adored Anne sincerely. When all said and done, Miss Shirley, ma'am, I haven't seen anyone in Boston that's equal to you, she said frankly. Paul was almost grown up, too. He was sixteen, his chestnut curls had given place to close-cropped brown locks, and he was more interested in football than fairies. But the bond between him and his old teacher still held. Kindred spirits alone do not change with changing years. It was a wet, bleak, cruel evening in July when Anne came back to Green Gables. One of the fierce summer storms which sometimes sweep over the gulf was ravaging the sea. As Anne came in, the first raindrops dashed against the panes. "'Was that Paul who brought you home?' asked Marilla. "'Why didn't you make him stay all night? It's going to be a wild evening.' "'He'll reach Echo Lodge before the rain gets very heavy, I think. Anyway, he wanted to go back tonight. Well, I've had a splendid visit.' But I'm glad to see you dear folks again. East, West, Hames, Best. Davy, have you been growing again lately? I've grown a whole inch since you left, said Davy proudly. I'm as tall as Milty Bolter now. Ain't I glad? He'll have to stop crowing about being bigger. Say, Anne, did you know that Gilbert Blythe is dying? Anne stood quite silent and motionless, looking at Davy. Her face had gone so white that Marilla thought she was going to faint. "'Davy, hold your tongue,' said Mrs. Rachel angrily. "'Anne, don't look like that. Don't look like that. We didn't mean to tell you so suddenly.' "'Is it true?' asked Anne in a voice that was not hers. "'Gilbert is very ill,' said Mrs. Lynde gravely. He took down with typhoid fever just after he left for Echo Lodge. Did you never hear of it? No, said that unknown voice. It was a very bad case from the start. The doctor said he'd been terribly run down. They've a trained nurse and everything's been done. Don't look like that, Anne. While there's life, there's hope. Mr. Harrison was here this evening, and he said they had no hope of him reiterated Davy. Marilla, looking old and worn and tired, got up and marched Davy grimly out of the kitchen. "'Oh, don't look so, dear,' said Mrs. Rachel, putting her kind old arms about the pallid girl. "'I haven't given up hope, indeed I haven't. He's got the blithe constitution in his favour, that's what.' Anne gently put Mrs. Lynde's arms away from her walked blindly across the kitchen, through the hall, up the stairs to her old room. At its window she knelt down, staring out unseeingly. It was very dark. The rain was beating down over the shivering fields. The haunted woods was full of the groans of mighty trees wrung in the tempest, and the air throbbed with the thunderous crash of billows on the distant shore. And Gilbert was dying. There is a book of revelation in everyone's life, as there is in the Bible. Anne read hers that bitter night, as she kept her agonized vigil through the hours of storm and darkness. She loved Gilbert, 
had always loved him. She knew that now. She knew that she could no more cast him out of her life without agony than she could have cut off her right hand and cast it from her. And the knowledge had come too late. Too late even for the bitter solace of being with him at the last. If she had not been so blind, so foolish, she would have had the right to go to him now. But he would never know that she loved him. He would go away from this life thinking that she did not care. Oh, the black years of emptiness stretching before her. She could not live through them. She could not. She cowered down by her window and wished for the first time in her gay young life that she could die too. If Gilbert went away from her without one word or sign or message, she could not live. Nothing was of any value without him. She belonged to him and he to her. In her hour of supreme agony she had no doubt of that. He did not love Christine Stuart, never had loved Christine Stuart. Oh, what a fool she had been not to realise what the bond was that had held her to Gilbert. To think that the flattered fancy she had felt for Roy Gardner had been love. And now she must pay for her folly as for a crime. Mrs. Lynde and Marilla crept to her door before they went to bed shook their heads doubtfully at each other over the silence, and went away. The storm raged all night, but when the dawn came it was spent. Anne saw a fairy fringe of light on the skirts of darkness. Soon the eastern hilltops had a fire-shot ruby rim. The clouds rolled themselves away into great soft white masses on the horizon. The sky gleamed blue and silvery. A hush fell over the world. Anne rose from her knees and crept downstairs. The freshness of the rain wind blew against her white face as she went out into the yard and cooled her dry, burning eyes. A merry, rollicking whistle was lilting up the lane. A moment later, Pacifique Buot came in sight. Anne's physical strength suddenly failed her, if she had not clutched at a low willow bough, she would have fallen. Pacifique was George Fletcher's hired man, and George Fletcher lived next door to the Blythes. Mrs. Fletcher was Gilbert's aunt. Pacifique would know if... if... Pacifique would know what there was to be known. Pacifique strode sturdily on along the red lane, whistling. He did not see Anne. She made three futile attempts to call him. He was almost past before she succeeded in making her quivering lips call, Pacifique. Pacifique turned with a grin and a cheerful good morning. Pacifique, said Anne faintly. Did you come from George Fletcher's this morning? Sure, said Pacifique amiably. I got the word last night that my father, he was sick. It was so stormy that I couldn't go then. So I stopped there early this morning. I'm going through the woods for shortcut. Did you hear how Gilbert Blythe was this morning? Anne's desperation drove her to the question. Even the worst would be more endurable than this hideous suspense. He's better, said Pacifique. He got the turn last night. The doctors say he'll be all right now this soon while. Had close shave, though. That boy, he just killed himself at college. Well, I must hurry. The old man, he'll be in a hurry to see me. Pacifique resumed his walk and his whistle. Anne gazed after him with eyes where joy was driving out the strained anguish of the night. He was a very lank, very ragged, very homely youth, but in her sight he was as beautiful as those who bring good tidings on the mountains. Never, as long as she lived, would Anne see Pacifique's brown, round, black-eyed face without a warm remembrance of the moment when he had given to her the oil of joy for mourning. Long after Pacifique's gay whistle had faded into the phantom of music and then into silence far up under the maples of Lover's Lane, Anne stood under the willows, tasting the poignant sweetness of life when some great dread has been removed from it. 
The morning was a cup filled with mist and glamour. In the corner near her was a rich surprise of new-blown crystal-dewed roses. The trills and trickles of song from the birds in the big tree above her seemed in perfect accord with her mood. A sentence from a very old, very true, very wonderful book came to her lips. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. End of chapter 40 Chapter 41 Love Takes Up the Glass of Time I've come up to ask you to go for one of our old-time rambles through September woods and over hills where spices grow this afternoon, said Gilbert, coming suddenly round the porch corner. Suppose we visit Hester Gray's garden. Anne, sitting on the stone step with her lap full of a pale, filmy green stuff, looked up rather blankly. Oh, I wish I could, she said slowly. But I really can't, Gilbert. I'm going to Alice Penhowell's wedding this evening, you know. I've got to do something to this dress, and by the time it's finished, I'll have to get ready. I'm so sorry. I'd love to go. Well, you can go tomorrow afternoon, then, asked Gilbert, apparently not much disappointed. Yes, I think so. In that case, I shall hie me home at once to do something I should otherwise have to do tomorrow. So Alice Penhallow is to be married tonight. Three weddings for you in one summer, Anne. Phil's, Alice's, and Jane's. I'll never forgive Jane for not inviting me to her wedding. You really can't blame her when you think of the tremendous Andrew's connection who had to be invited. The house could hardly hold them all. I was only bidden by grace of being Jane's old chum, at least on Jane's part. I think Mrs. Harmon's motive for inviting me was to let me see Jane's surpassing gorgeousness. Is it true that she wore so many diamonds that you couldn't tell where the diamonds left off and Jane began? Anne laughed. <laughs> she certainly wore a good many. What with all the diamonds and white satin and tulle and lace and roses and orange blossoms, prim little Jane was almost lost to sight. But she was very happy. And so was Mr. Inglis. And so was Mrs. Harmon. Is that the dress you're going to wear tonight? asked Gilbert, looking down at the fluffs and frills. Yes, isn't it pretty? And I shall wear star flowers in my hair. The haunted wood is full of them this summer. Gilbert had a sudden vision of Anne arrayed in a frilly green gown with the virginal curves of arms and throat slipping out of it and white stars shining against the coils of her ruddy hair. The vision made him catch his breath, but he turned lightly away. Well, I'll be up tomorrow. Hope you'll have a nice time tonight. Anne looked after him as he strode away and sighed. Gilbert was friendly, very friendly, far too friendly. He had come quite often to Green Gables after his recovery, and something of their old comradeship had returned. But Anne no longer found it satisfying. The rose of love made the blossom of friendship pale and scentless by contrast, and Anne had again begun to doubt if Gilbert now felt anything for her but friendship. In the common light of common day, her radiant certainty of that rapt morning had faded. She was haunted by a miserable fear that her mistake could never be rectified. It was quite likely that it was Christine whom Gilbert loved after all. Perhaps he was even engaged to her. Anne tried to put all unsettling hopes out of her heart and reconcile herself to a future where work and ambition must take the place of love. She could do good, if not noble, work as a teacher, and the success her little sketches were beginning to meet with in certain editorial sanctums augured well for her budding literary dreams. But, but, Anne picked up her green dress and sighed again. When Gilbert came the next afternoon, he found Anne waiting for him, fresh as the dawn and fair as a star after all the gaiety of the preceding night. She wore a green dress, not the one she had worn to the wedding, but an old one which Gilbert had told her at a Redmond reception he liked especially. 
It was just the shade of green that brought out the rich tints of her hair and the starry grey of her eyes and the iris-like delicacy of her skin. Gilbert, glancing at her sideways as they walked along a shadowy wood path, thought she had never looked so lovely. Anne, glancing sideways at Gilbert now and then, thought how much older he looked since his illness. It was as if he had put boyhood behind him for ever. The day was beautiful, and the way was beautiful. Anne was almost sorry when they reached Hester Gray's garden and sat down on the old bench. But it was beautiful there, too, as beautiful as it had been on the faraway day of the golden picnic, when Diana and Jane and Priscilla and she had found it. Then it had been lovely with Narcissus and Violets, now goldenrod had kindled its fairy torches in the corners, and asters dotted it bluely. The call of the brook came up through the woods from the valley of birches, with all its old allurement. The mellow air was full of the purr of the sea. Beyond were fields rimmed by fences bleached silvery grey in the sun of many summers, and long hills scarfed with the shadows of autumnal clouds. With the blowing of the west wind, old dreams returned. I think, said Anne softly, that the land where dreams come true is in the blue haze yonder, over that little valley. Have you any unfulfilled dreams, Anne? asked Gilbert. Something in his tone, something she had not heard since that miserable evening in the orchard at Patty's place, made Anne's heart beat wildly, but she made answer lightly. Of course, everybody has. It wouldn't do for us to have all our dreams fulfilled. We would be as good as dead if we had nothing left to dream about. What a delicious aroma that low-descending sun is extracting from the asters and ferns. I wish we could see perfumes as well as smell them. I'm sure they would be very beautiful. Gilbert was not to be thus sidetracked. I have a dream, he said slowly. I persist in dreaming it, although it has often seemed to me that it could never come true. I dream of a home with a hearth fire in it, a cat and dog, the footsteps of friends, and you. Anne wanted to speak, but she could find no words. Happiness was breaking over her like a wave. It almost frightened her. I asked you a question over two years ago, Anne. If I ask it again today, will you give me a different answer? Still Anne could not speak, but she lifted her eyes, shining with all the love rapture of countless generations, and looked into his for a moment. He wanted no other answer. They lingered in the old garden until twilight, sweet as dusk in Eden must have been, crept over it. There was so much to talk over and recall, things said and done and heard and thought and felt and misunderstood. I thought you loved Christine Stewart, Anne told him, as reproachfully as if she had not given him every reason to suppose that she loved Roy Gardner. Gilbert laughed boyishly. Christine was engaged to somebody in her hometown. I knew it, and she knew I knew it. When her brother graduated, she told me his sister was coming to Kingsport the next winter to take music, and asked me if I would look after her a bit, as she knew no one and would be very lonely. So I did. And then I liked Christine for her own sake. She is one of the nicest girls I have ever known. I knew college gossip credited us with being in love with each other. I didn't care. Nothing mattered much to me for a time there, after you told me you could never love me, Anne. There was nobody else. There never could be anybody else for me but you. I loved you ever since that day you broke your slate over my head in school. I don't see how you could keep on loving me when I was such a little fool, said Anne. Well, I tried to stop, said Gilbert, frankly. Not because I thought you what you call yourself, but because I felt sure that there was no chance for me after Gardner came on the scene. But I couldn't, and I can't tell you either, 
what it's meant to me these two years to believe you are going to marry him, and be told every week by some busybody that your engagement was on the point of being announced. I believed it until one blessed day when I was sitting up after the fever. I got a letter from Phil Gordon, Phil Blake, rather, in which she told me there was really nothing between you and Roy, and advised me to try again. Well, the doctor was amazed at my rapid recovery after that. Anne laughed, and then shivered. I can never forget the night I thought you were dying, Gilbert. Oh, I knew, I knew then, and I thought it was too late. But it wasn't, sweetheart. Oh, Anne, this makes up for everything, doesn't it? Let's resolve to keep this day sacred to perfect beauty all our lives for the gift it has given us. It's the birthday of our happiness, said Anne softly. I've always loved this old garden of Hester Gray's, and now it will be dearer than ever. But I'll have to ask you to wait a long time, Anne, said Gilbert sadly. It'll be three years before I'll finish my medical course. And even then there will be no diamond sunbursts and marble halls. Anne laughed. <laughs> I don't want sunbursts and marble halls. I just want you. You see, I'm quite as shameless as Phil about it. Sunbursts and marble halls may be all very well, but there is more scope for imagination without them. And as for the waiting, that doesn't matter. We'll just be happy. Waiting and working for each other, and dreaming. Oh, dreams will be very sweet now. Gilbert drew her close to him and kissed her. Then they walked home together in the dusk, crowned king and queen in the bridal realm of love, along winding paths fringed with the sweetest flowers that ever bloomed, and over haunted meadows where winds of hope and memory blew. End of Anne of the Island by L. M. Montgomery The Seaside Novelette in Chapter 21 from Happy Days by A. A. Milne of Dramatic Reading Scene and Story Collection, Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cast list. Narrator. Read by Beeswax Candle. Gwendolen. Read by Jen Broda. Lord Beltravers. Read by Todd. Lady Beltravers. Read by Agnes Robert Bear. John French. Read by Larry Wilson. Chapter 1. Primrose Farm. Primrose Farm stood slumbering in the sunlight of an early summer morn save for the gentle breeze which played in the tops of the two tall elms all nature seemed at rest chanticleer had ceased his song the pigs were asleep in the barn the cow lay thinking a deep peace brooded over the rural scene the peace of centuries terrible to think that in a few short hours but perhaps it won't the truth is i have not quite decided whether to have the murder in this story or in number 99, the severed thumb. We shall see. As her alarum clock, a birthday present, struck five, Gwendolen French sprang out of bed and plunged her face into the clump of nettles which grew outside her lattice window. For some minutes she stood there, breathing in the incense of the day. Then, dressing quickly, she went down to the great oak-beamed kitchen to prepare breakfast for her father and the pigs. As she went about her simple duties, she sang softly to herself, a song of love and knightly deeds. Little did she think that a lover, even at that moment, stood outside her door. Hi ho, sighed Gwendolen, and she poured the bran mash into a bowl and took it up to her father's room. For eighteen years, Gwendolen French had been the daughter of John French of Primrose Farm. Endowed by nature with a beauty that is seldom seen outside this sort of story, she was as yet as modest and as good a girl as was to be found in the county. 
Many a fine lady would have given all her Parisian diamonds for the peach-like complexion which bloomed on the fair face of Gwendolen. But the gifts of nature are not to be bought and sold. There was a sudden knock at the door. Come in, cried Gwendolen's surprise. Unless it was the cow, it was an entirely unexpected visitor. A tall, handsome young man entered, striking his head violently against a beam as he stepped into the low-ceiling kitchen. "'Good morning,' he said, repressing the remark which came more readily to his lips. "'Pray forgive this intrusion. The fact is, I have lost my way, and I wondered whether you would be kind enough to inform me as to my whereabouts.' Gwendolen curtsied. "'This is Primrose Farm, sir,' she said. "'I fear,' he replied with a smile. "'It has been my misfortune never to have heard so charming a name before. "'I am Lord Beltravers of Beltravers Castle, Beltravers. "'Having returned last night from India, "'I came out for an early stroll this morning, "'and I fear that I have wandered out of my direction.' Why, cried Gwendolen, your lordship is miles from Beltravers Castle. How tired and hungry you must be. She removed a lettuce from the kitchen chair, dusted it, and offered it to him. That is to say, the chair. Let me get you some milk, she added. Picking up a pail, she went out to inspect the cow. Gad, said Lord Beltravers, as soon as he was alone. He paced rapidly up and down the tiled kitchen. Deuce take it, he added recklessly. She's a lovely girl. The Beltraverses were noted in two continents for their hard swearing. Here you are, sir, said Gwendolen, returning with the precious liquid. Lord Beltravers seized the pail and drained it at a draught. Heavens, but that was good, he said. What was it? Milk said Gwendolen. Milk, I must remember. And now may I trespass on your hospitality still further, by trespassing on your assistance so far as to solicit your help in putting me far enough on my path to discover my way back to Beltravers Castle? When he was alone, he said that sentence again to himself, and wondered what had happened to it. I will show you, she said simply. They passed out into the sunlit orchard. In an apple tree a thrush was singing. The gooseberries were overripe. Beet roots were flowering everywhere. You are very beautiful, he said. Yes, said Gwendolen. I must see you again. Listen, tonight my mother, Lady Beltravers, is giving a ball. Do you dance? Alas, not the tango she said sadly. The Beltraverses do not tang, he announced with simple dignity. You valse? Good. Then will you come? Thank you, my lord. Oh, I should love to. That is excellent. And now I must bid you goodbye. But first, will you not tell me your name? Gwendolen French, my lord. Ah, one F or two? Three, said Gwendolen simply. Chapter Two, Beltravers Castle. Beltravers Castle was a blaze of lights. At the head of the old oak staircase, a magnificent example of the Selfridge period, the Lady Beltravers stood receiving her guests. Magnificently gowned in one of Rumpelmeyer's latest creations, and wearing round her neck the famous Beltravers seed pearls, she looked the picture of stately magnificence. As each guest was announced by a bevy of footmen, she extended her perfectly gloved hand and spoke a few words of kindly welcome. Good evening, Duchess. So good of you to look in. Ah, Earl, charmed to meet you. You'll find some sandwiches in the billiard room. Bell Travers, she'll be ale some sandwiches. How do you do, Professor? Delighted you could come. Won't you take off your galoshes? 
all the county was there. Lord Hobble was then wearing a magnificent stud. Erasmus Belt, the famous author, whose novel, Bitten, a Romance, went into two editions. Sir Septimus Root, the inventor of the fireproof spat. Captain, the Honourable Alfred Nibbs, the popular breeder of blood goldfish. The whole world and his wife were present. And towering above them all stood Lord Beltravers of Beltravers Castle, Beltravers. Lord Beltravers stood aloof in a corner of the great ballroom. Above his head was the proud coat of arms of the Beltraverses, a headless sardine on a field of tomato. As each new arrival entered, Lord Beltravers scanned his or her countenance eagerly, and then turned away with a snarl of disappointment. Would his little country maid never come? She came at last. Attired in a frock which had obviously been created in Little Popley, she looked the picture of girlish innocence as she stood for a moment hesitating in the doorway. Then her eyes brightened as Lord Beltravers came towards her with long, swinging strides. "'You're here!' he exclaimed. "'How good of you to come! I have thought of you ever since this morning. There is a valse beginning. Will you valse it with me?' Thank you, said Gwendolen shyly. Lord Beltravers, who valsed divinely, put his arm around her waist and led her into the circle of dancers. Chapter 3. Affianced The ball was at its height. Gwendolen, who had been into supper eight times, placed her hand timidly on the arm of Lord Beltravers, who had just begged a polka of her. Let us sit this out, she said. Not here, in the garden. Yes, said Lord Beltravers gravely. Let us go. I have something to say to you. Offering her his arm, he led her down the great terrace which ran along the back of the house. How wonderful to have your ancestors always round you like this, cooed Gwendolen as she gazed with reverence at the two statues which fronted them. Venus, said Lord Beltravers shortly. And Samson. He led her down the steps and into the ornamental garden, and there they sat down. Miss French, said Lord Beltravers. Or, if I may call you by that sweet name, Gwendolen, I have brought you here for the purpose of making an offer to you. Perhaps it would have been more in accordance with etiquette, had I approached your mother first. Mother is dead, said the girl simply. I am sorry, said Lord Beltravers, bending his head in courtly sympathy. In that case I should have asked your father to hear my suit. Father is deaf, she replied. He couldn't have heard it. Tut, tut, said Lord Beltravers impatiently. I beg your pardon, he added at once. I should have controlled myself. That being so, he went on, I have the honour to make to you, Miss French, an offer of marriage. May I hope? Gwendolen put her hand suddenly to her heart. The shock was too much for her fresh, young innocence. She was not really engaged to Giles Earwaker, though he too was hoping... And the only three times that Thomas Ritson had kissed her, she had threatened to box his ears. Lord Beltravers, she began. Call me Beltravers, he begged. Beltravers, I love you. I give you a simple maiden's heart. My darling, he cried, clasping her thumb impulsively. Then we are affianced. He slipped a ring off his finger and fitted it affectionately on two of hers. Wear this, he said gravely. It was my mother's. She was a data dingle. See, this is their crest. A rollless herring over the motto, Dans l'huile. Observing that she looked puzzled, he translated the noble French words to her. And now let us go in. Another dance is beginning. May I beg for the honour? Beltravers. She whispered lovingly. 
In chapter 4, Exposure. The next dance was at its height. In a dream of happiness, Gwendolen revolved with closed eyes round Lord Beltravers of Beltravers Castle Beltravers. Suddenly, above the music, rose a voice, commanding, threatening. Stop! cried the Lady Beltravers. As if by magic, the band ceased, and all the dancers were still. There is an intruder here, said Lady Beltravers in a cold voice. A milkmaid, a common farmer's daughter. Wendelin French, leave my house this instant. Dazed, hardly knowing what she did, Gwendolen moved forward. In an instant, Lord Beltravers was after her. No, mother, he said with the utmost dignity. Not a common milkmaid, but the future Lady Beltravers. An indescribable thrill of emotion ran through the crowded ballroom. Lord Hobble's stud fell out, and Lady Susan Golightly hurried across the room and fainted in the arms of Sir James Bat. What? cried the Lady Beltravers. My son, the last of the Beltraverses, the Beltraverses who came over with Julius Warner, I should say Caesar, marry a milkmaid. No, mother. He is marrying what any man would be proud to marry. A simple English girl. There was a cheer, instantly suppressed from a socialist in the band. For just a moment, words failed the Lady Beltravers. Then she sank into a chair and waved her guests away. The ball is over, she said slowly. Leave me. My son and I must be alone. One by one, with murmured thanks for a delightful evening, the guests trooped out. Soon, mother and son were alone. Lord Beltravers, gazing out of the window, saw the cellist laboriously dragging his cello across the park. Chapter 5. Wedded. And now, dear readers, I am in a difficulty. How shall the story go on? The editor of the Seaside Library asks quite frankly for a murder. His idea was that the Lady Beltravers should be found dead in the park next morning, and that Gwendolen should be arrested. This seems to me both crude and vulgar. Besides, I want a murder for number 99 of the series, The Severed Thumb. No, I think I know a better way out. Old John French sat beneath a spreading pear tree and waited. Early that morning a mysterious note had been brought to him, asking for an interview on a matter of the utmost importance. This was the trysting place. I have come, said a voice behind him, to ask you to beg your daughter. I have come, cried the Lady Beltravers, to ask you. I have come shouted her ladyship. Two. John French wheeled round in amazement. With a cry, the Lady Beltravers shrank back. Eustace? She gasped. Eustace, Earl of Turbot. Eli, sir. What are you doing here? I came to see John French. What? He asked with his hand to his ear. She repeated her remark loudly several times. I am John French, he said at last. When you refused me and married Beltravers, I suddenly felt tired of society, and I changed my name and settled down here as a simple farmer. My daughter helps me on the farm. Then your daughter is... Lady Gwendolen Hake. A beautiful double wedding was solemnized at Beltravers in October, the Earl of Turbot leading Eliza, Lady Beltravers, to the altar, while Lord Beltravers was joined in matrimony to the beautiful Lady Gwendolen Hake. There were many presents on both sides, which partook equally of the beautiful and the costly. 
Lady Gwendolen Beltravers is now the most popular hostess in the county. But to her husband, she always seems the simple English milkmaid that he first thought her. Ah. End of the Seaside Novelette Story of the Engine That Thought It Could by Rev. Charles S. Wing of Dramatic Reading Scene and Story Collection, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Spick and Span New Engine, read by Agnes Robert Bear. Superintendent of the Railroad Yard, read by Brian Fullen. Large, Strong Engine, read by Stunning. Another Great Engine, read by the Countess. Narrator, read by Larry Wilson. The Reverend Dr. Charles S. Wing, presiding elder of the New York East Conference, told the story last Sunday evening, in which he gained an unusual amount of realism by the adaptation of the sounds of his words to the requirements of his description. He was talking at the time to a congregation assembled in the Nostrand Avenue Methodist Episcopal Church to see the mortgage burn. In describing how the church had slowly and painfully gained the money that had freed it from debt after a struggle of thirty-nine years, Dr. Wing branched out into the following little parable. In a certain railroad yard there stood an extremely heavy train that had to be drawn up an unusually heavy grade before it could reach its destination. The superintendent of the yard was not sure what it was best for him to do. So he went up to a large, strong engine and asked, Can you pull that train over the hill? It is a very heavy train, responded the engine. He then went to another great engine and asked, Can you pull that train over the hill? It is a very heavy grade, it replied. The superintendent was much puzzled, but he turned to still another engine that was pick and span new, and he asked it. Can you pull that train over the hill? I think I can, responded the engine. So the order was circulated, and the engine was started back so that it might be coupled with the train, and as it went along the rails it kept repeating to itself, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Then it reached the grade, but its voice could still be heard. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Higher and higher it climbed, and its voice grew fainter, and its words came slower. I think. I can. It was almost to the top. I think. It was at the top. I can. It passed over the top of the hill and began crawling down the opposite slope. I think I can. I think. I thought I could, I thought I could, I thought I could, I thought I could, I thought I could. And singing its triumph, it rushed on down toward the valley. End of story of the engine that thought it could. Mrs. Tittlemouse by Beatrix Potter Of Dramatic Reading Scene and Story Collection of Volume 004 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Narrator, read by Agnes Robert Bear Babbity Bumble, read by Life is But a Dream Big Fat Spider, read by David Lawrence 
Mr. Jackson, read by Beeswax Candle. Mrs. Tittlemouse, read by Victoria Bell. Once upon a time, there was a wooden mouse, and her name was Mrs. Tittlemouse. She lived in a bank under a hedge. Such a funny house. There were yards and yards of sandy passages, leading to storerooms and nut cellars and seed cellars, all amongst the roots of the hedge. There was a kitchen, a parlor, a pantry, and a larder. Also there was Mrs. Tittlemouse's bedroom, where she slept in a little box bed. Mrs. Tittlemouse was a most terrible, tidy, particular little mouse, always sweeping and dusting the soft, sandy floors. Sometimes a beetle lost its way in the passages. Shoo, shoo, little dirty feet, said Mrs. Tittlemouse, clattering her dustpan. And one day, a little old woman ran up and down in a red spotty cloak. Your house is on fire, Mother Ladybird. Fly away home to your children. Another day, a big fat spider came into shelter from the rain. Big pardon, is this not Miss Muppets? Go away, you bold bad spider, leaving ends of cobwebs all over my nice clean house. She bundled the spider out a window. He let himself down the hedge with a long thin bit of string. Mrs. Tittlemouse went on her way to a distant storeroom to fetch cherry stones and thistle down seed for dinner. All along the passage she sniffed and looked at the floor. I smell a smell of honey. Is it the cowslips outside in the hedge? I'm sure I can see the marks of little dirty feet. Suddenly round a corner she met Babbity Bumble. Zzz, bzz, bzz, said the bumblebee. Mrs. Tittlemouse looked at her severely. She wished that she had a broom. Good day, Babbity Bumble. I should be glad to buy some beeswax. But what are you doing down here? Why do you always come in at a window and say ziz, biz, biz? Mrs. Tittlemouse began to get cross. Ziz, whiz, whiz, replied Babbity Bumble in a peevish squeak. She sidled down the passage and disappeared into a storeroom which had been used for acorns. Mrs. Tittlemouse had eaten the acorns before Christmas. The storeroom ought to have been empty. But it was full of untidy dry moss. Mrs. Tittlemouse began to pull out the moss. Three or four other bees put out their heads and buzzed fiercely. I am not in the habit of letting lodgings. This is an intrusion, said Mrs. Tittlemouse. I will have them turned out. Buzz, buzz, buzz. I wonder who would help me. Buzz, buzz, buzz. I will not have Mr. Jackson. He never wipes his feet. Mrs. Tittlemouse decided to leave the bees till after dinner. When she got back to the parlor, she heard someone coughing in a fat voice, and there sat Mr. Jackson himself. He was sitting all over a small rocking chair, twiddling his thumbs and smiling, with his feet on the fender. He lived in a drain below the hedge, in a very dirty wet ditch. How do you do, Mr. Jackson? Dearie me, you've got very wet. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mrs. Tittlemouse. I'll sit a while and dry myself, said Mr. Jackson. He sat and smiled, and the water dripped off his coattails. Mrs. Tittlemouse went round with a mop. He sat such a while that he had to be asked if he would take some dinner. First she offered him cherry stones. Thank you, thank you, Mrs. Tittlemouse. No teeth, no teeth, no teeth. Teeth, said Mr. Jackson. He opened his mouth most unnecessarily wide. He certainly had not a tooth in his head. Then she offered him thistle-down seed. Diddly, widdly, widdly, poof, poof, puff, said Mr. Jackson. He blew the thistle-down all over the room. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mrs. Tittlemouse. Now I would really, really should like would be a little dish of honey. I am afraid I have not got any, Mr. Jackson, said Mrs. Tittlemouse. Tiddly, widdly, widdly, Mrs. Tittlemouse, said the smiling Mr. Jackson. I can smell it. That is why I came to call. Mr. Jackson rose ponderously from the table 
and began to look into the cupboards. Mrs. Tittlemouse followed him with a dishcloth to wipe his large wet footmarks off the parlor floor. When he had convinced himself that there was no honey in the cupboards, he began to walk down the passage. Indeed, indeed, you will stick fast, Mr. Jackson. Tiddly, widdly, widdly, Mrs. Tittlemouse. First he squeezed into the pantry. Tiddly, widdly, widdly, no honey. No honey, Mrs. Tittlemouse. There were three creepy crawly people hiding in the plate rack. Two of them got away, but the littlest one he caught. Then he squeezed into the larder. Mrs. Butterfly was tasting the sugar, but she flew away out of the window. Tiddly, widdly, widdly, Mrs. Tittlemouse. You seem to have plenty of visitors. And without any invitation, said Mrs. Thomasina Tittlemouse. They went along the sandy passage. Tiddly, widdly. Buzz, whiz, whiz. He met Babbity round a corner and snapped her up and put her down again. I do not like bumblebees. They're all over bristles, said Mr. Jackson, wiping his mouth with his coat sleeve. Get out, you nasty old toad, shrieked Babbity Bumble. I shall go distracted, scolded Mrs. Tittlemouse. She shut herself up in the nut cellar while Mr. Jackson pulled out the bee's nest. He seemed to have no objection to stings. When Mrs. Tittlemouse ventured to come out, Everybody had gone away, for the untidiness was something dreadful. Never did I see such a mess. Smears of honey and moss and thistle-down and marks of big and little dirty feet all over my nice clean house. She gathered up the moss and the remains of the beeswax. Then she went out and fetched some twigs to partly close up the front door. I will make it too small for Mr. Jackson. She fetched soft soap and flannel and a new scrubbing brush from the storeroom, which she was too tired to do any more. First she fell asleep in her chair, and then she went to bed. Will it ever be tidy again? said poor Mrs. Tittlemouse. Next morning she got up very early, and began a spring cleaning which lasted a fortnight. She swept and scrubbed and dusted, and she rubbed up the furniture with beeswax, and polished her little tin spoons. When it was all beautifully neat and clean, she gave a party to five other little mice without Mr. Jackson. He smelt the party and came up the bank, but he could not squeeze in at the door. So they handed him out eight corn cupfuls of honeydew through the window, and he was not at all offended. He sat outside in the sun and said, Tiddly, widdly, widdly, your very good health, Mrs. Tittlemouse. End of Mrs. Tittlemouse by Beatrix Potter The Show Must Go On by Henry Slazer Section 7 of Dramatic Reading Scene and Story Collection, Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Narration, read by Keith Salas Sign, read by Agnes Robert Bear Control Voice, read by Jim Hedrick. Jerry Spicer, read by Greg Giordano. Woman, read by Jen Broda. T.D. by Nicole Wright. Frick, read by Todd. Miss Stitch, read by Agnes Robert Bear. Manford, read by Alan O. Impara. Crew 1, read by Lynette Calkins. Crew 2, Read by Rapunzelina. Fan Mail to Thrill Show by Scott Calkins. Letter 2. Read by M. Lee. Letter 3. Read by Elsie Selwyn. Letter 4. Read by Rich Brown. Dr. Stark. Read by Brian Fullen. Dr. Grayson and Staffer. Read by Red Run. He awoke in darkness, trembling with the thought of escape. His hands groped around the floor, trying its solidity. Then he crawled forward with agonizing slowness until his fingertips found a wall. He raised himself to his feet, his cheek scraping the cool surface of the enclosure. An idea came to him, 
and he slapped at the pocket of his shirt. His palm struck the outline of something. Matches. He lit one and raised it to the level of his wide, frightened eyes. He was facing a door, a barricade of steel, without sign of latch or doorknob. But there was a sign, and he read it in the flicker of the match flame. It said, Hush. He made a noise in his throat and shoved against the door. It gave in to his weight, and he was outside the building, standing in a courtyard washed softly by moonlight. He circled where he stood, and he knew he was a prisoner still. A wire fence four times his height surrounded him. He came closer to it and plunged his fingers through the mesh, rattling it helplessly in his misery. Then he saw the second sign and held his breath. It read, You can do it. Encouraged, he began his climb. The toes of his rubber-soled shoes fit neatly into the openings, and he gained the summit of the fence quickly. He swayed uncertainly at the top and almost dropped the twenty-five feet to the other side, but he regained his balance, clambered down the mesh, and dropped, panting, to the ground. A voice boomed at him. All right, let's go. We haven't got all night. He forced himself to his feet, and looked for the source of the sound with wild movements of his head. He could see nothing but the menacing shadows of a crowded forest. With a frightened glance over his shoulder, he plunged into the thick of it, hoping to find a pathway to the unknown freedom he sought. He thrashed through the tangled vines for a small eternity, and then gave up with a sob. He fell against a tree trunk, dampening the bark with his tears. This time the voice was quieter, but its tone was impatient. Keep going, keep going, to the right, the right. He clung to the tree as if for protection, and then, with a gasp, plunged once more into the darkness. He found the clearing to the right. It was like an arena with spectator trees, and with bright eyes winking at him through the leaves. There was a log to the left of the cleared green circle, and a frail young girl in torn clothing sat on it huddled with either fear or cold. She was clutching something like an infant to her chest. He came closer and saw that it was a broadsword. He paused. Who are you? He said. She looked up at him, her expression savage. You're here, she said. He took a step forward, and the voice spoke once more. Kill her, and you go free. No, he shouted. Kill him, and go free said the voice. The girl put her head in her arms. Her shoulders shook. He walked towards her and she screamed. Ah. No, please, he said painfully. I won't hurt you. Why should I hurt you? She looked at him narrowly, her hand tightened around the handle of the sword. You know why, she accused. You must trust me, he said. He put his hand out gently to her. She backed away from his touch and leapt off the log. She moved away cautiously, gripping the weapon with both hands. Use the sword, said the voice. Strike and go free. She trembled and lifted the sword from the ground. The man whirled, eyes penetrating the forest for an escape route. He backed up and fell over a trailing root. Now, said the voice, strike. The girl moved towards him hypnotically. I hate you. I hate you, she moaned. She lifted the blade high and the man lashed out with his foot as she towered over him. The broadsword flew from her grasp. Now kill her, said the voice, and you can go free. I won't, he shouted again. He scrambled to his feet and made a dive for the weapon. He took it in his hand and waved it threateningly at the surrounding woods. Come out! Come out! he screamed. The eyes of the forest blinked back at him in silence. He flung the sword from his hand as if in loathing, then he crashed into the forest once more. The producer gurgled through his hookomatic. Frick, his assistant, recognized this symptom of official disgust and jumped to his feet. Turn it off, the producer said, gesturing towards the Fidelivision screen. Frick turned it off. Oh, leave it on, the producer moaned peeping at the white oblong through his chubby fingers. Let's see what Manford does in this pickle. Frick turned it on. 
You'll probably drop in the dinosaur film, he said. <laughs> if he does, I get a new director, the producer answered in a rumbling voice. He's used that spot three times in the past month. The Fidelivision flashed. A screaming red title dripped bloodily across the screen. Man Against Dinosaur, it said. The producer's angry cry almost drowned out the horrific roar of the live prop brontosaurus that appeared. Meeting! Meeting! he cried. We are going to have a staff meeting right after the show. A live meeting? Frick gasped. A live one, the producer said. Everybody here, right here, in person, this is an emergency. Gosh, T.D. Frick frowned disapprovingly. That's kind of rough, isn't it? I mean, a phone screen session would be a lot simpler. It'll take hours for Manford and the rest of them to get through the jam. I don't care, the producer said petulantly. This kind of bumbling inefficiency has gone far enough. It'll do them good to get crushed in the traffic for a change. Frick paled, obviously disturbed by the severity of the punishment the producer was meeting out. Only the lowest ranks of employees, the non-executives, the factory people, were forced to suffer the indignities of the jam. I'm sure they'll get that fellow, Frick said. After all, T.D., how far can he get? When he gets out of the forest, he'll reach the studio barrier and he'll be stopped. Simple as that. And what if he finds the exit? Frick scoffed. Well, the odds on that. Odds? Don't talk to me about odds, Frick. The producer winced as man and brontosaurus came together on the screen. There was a close-up of the man's face, and his expression wasn't pretty when he saw the imitation beast. But of course he couldn't know it was harmless. The letters! The producer groaned. The complaints! I can see them now. The office door opened. A pretty redhead with vacant eyes and a frozen smile poked her head inside. What is it, Miss Stitch? Will you take a call for Mr. Manford? Phone screen seven. You bet I will, the producer said menacingly. Frick lowered the Fidelivision sound and flicked on PS7 with a few efficient motions. The face of Joe Manford, the director of the night's thrill show, was haggard despite the jovial smile. Hi, T.D., he said. Been watching the show? Yes, Joseph, the producer said gravely. Oh. The smile faded, but only for a moment. Well, nothing to worry about. Our boys will have that fellow rounded up in a few minutes. Can't imagine how that got fouled up, but that's the thrill show for you, full of surprises. Is that a fact? said the producer. He picked up the butt of his hook o -matic, and sipped smoke calmly. I presume this fellow was fully authorized before you put him on? Oh, yes, Manfred said hastily. He passed the routine FCC physical and had the usual adrenaline and hypnomecoil dose. I mean, you saw the girl, didn't you? She was fine, wasn't she? He beamed. Yes, said the producer. She certainly was fine. Frick stirred uncomfortably behind him. Anyway, the director continued. We're dropping in the dinosaur film. That's always good for a few shivers. And we've sent a crew into the studio to get that man out of there. The producer nodded his head toward his assistant. Frick, he said, eyes on Manford. You tell him. Frick stepped into range. He cleared his throat and looked at the floor. <clears throat> uh, there'll be a meeting after the show, he mumbled. Meeting? Manford said. What for? He blinked and looked at Frick's bowed head. Then he looked dazed. You don't mean a... a live meeting? Frick nodded. The producer puffed contentedly on his hook matic He blew a smoke ring, and it puffed itself into pieces against the phone screen. The man raised himself from the ground. His limbs felt weak. He had to force the breaths through his lungs. He got to his feet, feeling somewhat stronger. The forest seemed as impenetrable as ever, but he faced its challenge now with more confidence. That girl, he thought. My God, she was really going to kill him. He shook his head bewilderedly. Such a young, pretty girl. What had he done to her? What made her want to do it? He moved through the forest slowly, ducking branches, trailing the sources of dim lights in the distance. But as he approached, they proved to be illusory, odd reflections of moonlight among the trees. 
She didn't want to kill him, not really. He could sense that. It was something more. She was compelled to do it. That was it. Someone had put her up to it. But who? Who hated him enough? The speculation made his head ache. He blanked out his thoughts and decided to concentrate on his predicament. There had to be a way out. The girl had entered the forest at some point, but where? He heard the sound of voices and he stopped breathing. Manford means business, one of them said. He's plenty worried. T.D. was watching tonight. The sponsors kick T.D., T.D. kicks Manford, and Manford kicks us. Who do we kick? I don't know about you. I got an old dog home. Okay, let's separate and find this bird. Right. Hey, Lou, let's have some tracer lights. He concealed himself in the brush as a burst of light exploded over the treetops. He watched the men parade past. Ordinary-looking men, executive types with white collars and knit ties and flannel suits. Strangely enough, they seemed quite at home in this wilderness. He waited until they passed his hiding place. Then he started on a nimble run in the direction from which they had come. The producer fitted himself snugly into executive position. Desk, swivel chair, and man welded into one solid, efficient unit. He sighed a comfortable sigh and glanced up at the wall clock. 10.30. The thrill show would be over in half an hour. The dinosaur film would wind it up neatly. He'd probably have some explaining to do to the sponsors tomorrow but he was all prepared to give the usual popular demand argument. He regretted the live meeting he had called. It would be two hours at least before the staff plowed through the traffic jam. That meant he couldn't leave the office until after one thirty. He looked at the hopeless tower of papers on his desk plotter. Most of them were letters, and his secretary had never quite gotten the hang of weeding out the chaff. Once he found a letter from an FBC vice president in the discard file. Since then, he ordered all his mail to his desk. He wished he could get a better secretary than Miss Stitch, but the shortage of A1-rated secretaries, A for attractiveness, 1 for efficiency, was acute. He skimmed through the top of the pile quickly. Dear Mr. Donnelly, Certainly enjoyed Death in the Ring, one of the best thrill shows I've ever seen. Wonder if you would consider a football thriller I have in mind called Murder Kicks Off. Dear Mr. Donnelly, let's have more shows like Snake Pit. That mother and baby idea was the greatest. I really thought that woman would go nuts when she saw her kid with the cobra. A shocker all the way. Dear Mr. Donnelly, if Kiss of Death was your idea of entertainment, you ought to retire. Sort of sex smaltz went out with television. Give us real gutsy stuff and never mind the mush. I'm only 11 years old, but I'll bet I could write a better scenario than that. I have this idea for a show called... Dear Mr. Donnelly, the producer sighed again. He reached into his pill drawer and took an ulcer capsule. Then he went back to his correspondence. When the man entered his office, he didn't even glance up. That you, Frick? He said, eyes on a letter of praise from a Yonkers housewife. When the man didn't answer, the producer looked up. He gasped. Hey! He said. Shut up, the man said harshly. He moved swiftly towards the desk and lifted a bronze ashtray in a lightning motion. He raised the object threateningly over the fat man's head. Keep quiet, he said. What is this? The producer's voice quavered. Then he recognized the face. Y you're the one from the show. The man blinked. His face relaxed, and he lowered the impromptu weapon. I... I'm sorry. The producer came round the side of the desk. He took the ashtray from his hand and helped him into the interview chair. The man collapsed limply at his touch. How'd you get here? The producer said. I don't know, the man mumbled. I found a door back there. He buried his chin on his chest. His clothes were shredded and his hands were trembling. Just take it easy, the producer told him. He stabbed his finger on a desk button. The signal brought Frick into the office. 
What's up, T.D.? Then the assistant saw the man in the chair. My God, he whispered, swallowing hard. Gosh, uh, I'm terribly sorry, T.D. Never mind being sorry, the producer said gratingly. Let's just be thankful he found his way here instead of into the street, if he'd been picked up by the police. The assistant mopped his brow. That would have been terrible. They'd surely recognize him from the show. If the FCC saw him in this condition... Yes, the producer said grimly. If they saw him in this condition, their medical office would slap an injunction on us so fast, we'd all be out in the jam. Do you realize that? Frick blanched. I'll get Dr. Stark in here right away. We'll get him an anti-dope shot immediately. That girl, the man said. It's okay, fella, Frick said. You're okay now. Never mind him, said the producer. Get Spire in here right away. Frick hurried out. The producer poured a slug of brandy into a cup and held it to the man's lips. He gulped it gratefully and then exploded a rasping cough. When the cough subsided, he buried his head on his chest again, breathing heavily. The producer studied the man's face. It was oddly familiar. Say, he said. He put his hand under the chin and lifted the face up. The eyes opened. Aren't you Jerry Spicer? The man stared blankly. The producer grunted. Huh. Guess you don't know who you are right now, fella. But you're Jerry Spicer, all right. Imagine that. T.D. shook his head. The great Spicer in a thrill show. <laughs> he chuckled dryly. The doctor bustled into the office, a small cyclone, trailing the nervous assistant behind him like a flurrying dust cloud. Roll up his sleeve, he told the producer commandingly. He removed the hypodermic spray gun from his bag and carefully filled it with a dozen cc's of the antidote. He dabbed the man's arm with a shred of cotton and pressed the spray against his flesh. Good thing I hung around tonight, the doctor grumbled. If this man ever got away in this condition... We know, we know, the producer said tensely. Fix him up and cut the chatter. I saw that show, the doctor said. Somebody sure fouled up. Probably gave him an overdose. We'll get to that later, the producer promised. Just do your job, Doc. I'm through, Stark said crisply. Put him on that couch over there and raise his legs. He'll come to his senses in about ten minutes, I hope. Frick and the producer helped the man to the sofa. He sprawled on a full length, fingers trailing on the carpet. Do you know who he is? T.D. said. He's Jerry Spicer. Who? Spicer, the big TV star, you remember. The doctor halted the process of clasping his bag and came over to the sofa. He looked at the man's relaxed face. By God, he said. You're right. Now what the hell is Spicer doing on a thrill show? The producer shrugged. I don't know. I haven't heard anything about him for the past eight or ten years. He must have had it tough, Frick said musingly. I mean, a big star like that, on a program like this? What do you mean, a program like this? The producer looked displeased. If the staff had a nickel's worth of imagination, they would have played this up big. Gosh, said Frick. That's true. We could have used a credit card. I'll bet he wouldn't have permitted it, the doctor said. You know what Spicer thought of the thrill show? Yeah. The producer's face reddened. Well... We've proved how wrong he was, didn't we? The public was just sick and tired of that namby-pamby stuff. There had to be a thrill show. Sponsors demanded it, Frick said loyally. And besides, T.D. added, If he doesn't like us, what the hell did he sign up for? The doctor pursed his lips. Maybe he was hungry, Frick said. He's still not coming round, Doc. He'd better, Stark said warningly. If the antidote doesn't work, it could mean a lot of trouble for the thrill show, Mr. Donnelly. The producer looked frightened. That's ridiculous. It's got to work. It's always worked. You better call your staff, the doctor said. Find out what dosage they gave this man. Check his FCC medical authorization. And do it fast, Mr. Donnelly. This is just the kind of thing the FCC can hang you on. Thank God I called that meeting. The producer said. Here's the straight poop. Manford, the thrill show director, looked briskly around the room. 
They had gathered around the table in the conference room, the staff members still hollow-cheeked and shaken by their experience in the jam. This fellow came into the office last week and signed up for a spot in the thrill show. We needed somebody for the Battle of the Sexes show, and he was a pretty nice-looking guy. A little seedy, maybe, but all right. He gave his right name, here's his record, but nobody on the interviewing staff recognized him. Guess they're all a little too young to remember Jerry Spicer very well. All right. The producer prodded. So what happened? Well, just the routine things. The FCC medical officer gave him the standard physical. His psych check wasn't the best we've ever had, but that's always a debatable business. When he showed up for work yesterday, we gave him the regular dose of 10 cc's of adrenaline and 4 cc's of hypnomecoil. That's SOP for an anger emotion show, of course. The producer looked at Stark. Did you give him the shot? No. The doctor shuffled the papers in his hands. That new fellow, Grayson. Do you want to see him? He's gone home, Manfred said. It'll take an hour to get him here. Why not phone screen him? They took the director's suggestion. In a few minutes, the image of Dr. Phil Grayson appeared on phone screen four. He was a young man with a high, balding forehead and a rabbity mustache. He looked worried when his home screen brought him the picture of the intense group around the conference table. What is it? He said. Just checking back on some records, Doctor. Dee Dee said smoothly. Remember the man you injected today? This fellow Spicer for the Battle of the Sexes show? The doctor nodded. Of course. Was there anything unusual about the dosage? Grayson looked puzzled. Naturally not. I gave him the prescribed dosage, just like Dr. Stark told me. The 10 cc's of noradrenaline, the 44 cc's of that, what'd you call it, hypnomechalil? Why? Dr. Stark paled. I told you that, he said. The color rushed back into his cheeks, a bright crimson. I told you adrenaline, you fool. Not noradrenaline. And 4 cc's of hypnomechalil. He looked wildly at the men around the table. I swear I told him, he said. You didn't, the young doctor gasped. You told me forty-four. Stark jumped to his feet, his face livid. He started towards the phone screen as if to throttle the two-dimensional image on the glass. You're a liar, he cried. You knew it was an angry motion show. You knew what was required. I did didn't know, Grayson answered, his mustache twitching. You didn't tell me that. I just assumed. You assumed? The producer stood up, looking thunderclouds at Dr. Stark. You knew what kind of show it was, Stark. Why didn't you tell him? We needed an anger reaction, not fear. That's what Lau stopped the whole show. Manford groaned. What does that matter now? 44 cc's of hypnomecoil? What kind of a doctor are you, Grayson? Don't you know you could kill a man that way? I... I didn't know. I never worked with these mechalil drugs. I studied antibiotics. Better if it had killed him, the producer said darkly. We might have covered that up, but we can never get him past the FCC examining officer now. I swear he told me 44. I swear it. Dr. Stark made a rush at the phone screen. Grayson backed away in terror despite the many miles that were between him and Stark's intended violence. With a snarl, the older doctor reached up and turned off the instrument. Now we're in for it, he told the others. Maybe he'll be all right, Manfred said. Maybe he'll snap out of it. A little more anti-dope. Nonsense, Stark snapped. If it hasn't worked by now, it'll never work. The overdose has permanently affected his nervous system. He's an amnesiac for good. An amnesiac with a permanent case of the jitters. Frick shivered. God, what a fate. The producer looked wise. Yes. He said solemnly. He'd be better off dead, wouldn't he? The staff stared at him. You know what I'm talking about. T.D. said. He'd be better off dead. Better for him, for the thrill show, for us. Well? Manfred said feebly. Well, nothing. The producer's voice was harsh. Do you get the significance of all this? Do you know what happens when the FCC medical officer wants to recheck Spicer? 
an injunction, a court battle. Then Spicer goes to the stand as Exhibit A, and we lose. No more thrill show. He looked at their faces individually. No more jobs, bankruptcy, poverty, the jam. This time, the shiver was collective. We can't let that happen. Manford licked his lips. What about the sponsors? They got pulled, don't they? They need us, don't they? I mean, nothing else will give them the kind of ratings they get from the thrill show. Their hands will be tied, T.D. said. One slip is all the federal boys have been waiting for. And with all that foreign criticism our State Department's been getting... They still buy our films abroad, another staff man said glumly. That won't matter. The producer sat down heavily and put the cold end of his hookah-matic in his mouth. The thrill show is doomed, let's face it. The group dropped their eyes to the table. Of course, the producer said quietly. There's one way out. It looked up at him hopefully. Remember Juan Esprenzo? He said. They stared at him. That was a troublesome situation, too. But we came out of that one, didn't we? They gaped silently. Juan Esperenzo was killed on the Angry City thrill show of November 19th, 1985. It was purely an accident, of course. He wandered out of the guide paths in the studio and was struck by a falling prop. Nobody could have foreseen it, and nobody could have prevented it. His family received $50,000 in insurance. The FCC investigation described the incident as unfortunate, and there was a special Juan Esperenzo memorial show held on January 3rd. But these things happen, just as they once did in boxing, football, racing. Nothing unusual, nothing to ban a program about. They turned their eyes to the outer room where Jerry Spicer lay in a coma on the studio sofa. Do you get what I mean? The producer said. Don't you think we could pass another investigation a la Esprenzo better than we could pass the one we're facing now? They looked hopeful and frightened in turn. You mean deliberately kill him, T.D.? Cause an accident? Kill him? Right on the program? Exactly, the producer said with a satisfied smile. Put him on again tomorrow night. Make it a setup. Have something go wrong. Then, keep the cameras trained on him while we rush out of the studio control room to find out if he's all right. The whole country will see it was an accident. Only an accident. He turned to Wilson, the head scriptwriter. Wilson, he said. You've got an assignment. He awoke in darkness, trembling with the thought of escape. His hands groped around the floor, trying its solidity. When his fingertips found a wall, he raised himself with agonizing slowness his nails scraping along the ridges in the damp stone. He pressed his hot cheek against the cool surface and sobbed pitifully. When his eyes adjusted to the feeble light, he measured the strength of his prison and felt the added terror of hopelessness. He turned his eyes to the pool of darkness in the center of the dungeon and ventured forth a cautious foot. He had taken only three steps before he heard the voice. Look out, it said. Then he saw the pit. He looked with horror at the writhing beasts inside. He sank to his knees and stared in terrible fascination at their swaying bodies. Then he buried his face in his hands. He looked up when he heard the swish above him, gleaming, swinging, evoking a memory in an impossibly distant past. It was a pendulum of razor-sharp steel, and it was descending. He screamed. He lifted his arms above his head. The pendulum ground to a halt, the mechanism groaning and screeching in protest. There was a second of silence, and then the blade fell to earth with the suddenness of an avenging sword. This time the scream was cut off in his throat, and the giant weapon flattened him sickeningly against the edge of the precipice. Vaguely, as in a dream, he heard the sound of speech and running footsteps. My God! It broke. The pendulum broke. Somebody get the doctor. Look out for that pit. It's a 40-foot drop. Come on. A hand touched his shoulder, and a ring of anxious faces floated like pink balloons over his head. I think he's still alive. What? He can't be. That thing weighs a ton. Well, he looks pretty bad, but I can see his eyes moving, and he seems to be... Get that blade off him. He knew that the great weight had been removed from his body, but he could feel no difference. 
He was looking with almost objective interest into the face of a fat man, a familiar face with wide eyes and an open, bow-lipped mouth. The face was covered with a film of nervous perspiration, and there was a strange sort of anxiety in the man's movements. He's got to be, he's got to be, the fat man was whispering intently. But, T.D. Shut up! When you lift him up, I want you to... He heard nothing more, but his eyes remained open, fixing the face of the fat man. Then he felt arms around his shoulders once more, and he felt himself slipping, slipping back towards the edge. With a spurt of strength and with a flash of sudden intelligence, he raised his left arm, and the fingers caught the collar surrounding the fat man's neck in loose folds. He held on grimly until the fat man screamed with satisfying terror. Look out, T.G., somebody shrieked. He's dragging me with him! The fat man flailed out helplessly. He's pulling me over the edge! Somebody else leapt to his aid, but the dying man's grip was tenacious, his purpose certain. We're going over! They did, the fat man and his victim, and cameras three, four, and five caught the action beautifully. Miss Stitch slipped her compact back into her purse and straightened the corners of the stack of mail on her desk blotter. She looked towards the empty office of the producer and smiled with secretive pleasure. She slid open the envelopes in front of her and leisurely read the morning mail. Dear Mr. Donnelly, boy, oh boy, what a thrill you gave us the other night. I thought Pit and the Pendulum was one of the best thrill shows yet. I sure was disappointed when I saw the title card and thought you were going to rehash that old Poe bit. But that new ending of yours really knocked me cold. I sure got a kick out of seeing that fat old guy going over the edge of the pit. What a terrific wind-up. I wonder if you would be interested in a really great story idea. You see, there's this crazy old guy who has a secret laboratory on a mountaintop. Well, one night it's raining and lightning like mad. And this beautiful blonde comes along in a classy convertible. End of the show must go on. Love and Laughter by Emma Lindsay Squire of Dramatic Reading Scene and Story Collection, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrated by Inko. Frederick Simons. Read by Beeswax Candle. Theater Doorman. Read by Jim Hedrick. Injured Woman. Read by Agnes Robert Bear. Evelyn's Fan. Read by Nicole Wright. Mr. Butler. Theater Going Gossip. Evelyn Lorraine. And Lawrence Danvers. Read by Brian Fullen. She stood before him dark and straight and tempestuous, he found it a little difficult to maintain the careful impersonality of his tone. But Evelyn, my dear, you haven't answered my question. What can this Forbes Nathan give you that I can't, that I haven't? Her dark eyes, vivid with unrestrained emotion, filled with sudden tears. She was perhaps not conscious that she was acting. She had been an actress so long that she had ceased to analyse her reactions as to the quality of their sincerity. Her rich voice, the voice that had thrilled thousands of worshipful listeners from behind the amber footlights, held the same poignant notes of appeal now in the luxurious privacy of her husband's apartment as it would hold the night of her new play, The Sorrowful Lady. I want, I want love, love and laughter. If Lawrence Danvers was hurt, he gave no sign of it. He had what his lovely wife did not suspect, a facile imagination. He also understood her, although he had never permitted her to guess the fact. She was curiously like a child, reveling the eternal playtime of life and emotion. Well, he knew that a single careless word of his at any moment of the eight years of their married life might have brought the insecure structure tumbling about their ears. Those who marvelled at the fact that the prosaic businessman could win, and hold, the love of the exotic Evelyn Lorraine did not know that the simple, though subtle secret had been his matter-of-fact acceptance of every mood of her make-believe. Sometimes it had not been easy, particularly the times when she had fancied herself passionately in love with another man, usually an actor in her company. Lawrence Danvers knew these comet-like emotions for the everescent things they were, 
that he'd never made the mistake of belittling them, or of showing jealousy. He knew that his loose self-control was the bond that held Evelyn to him. He was not an actor by profession, but it required no mean skill to stand there, facing her passionate confession of this new love, without yielding to the temptation to cry out, to crush her in his arms and tell her savagely that she was his, his, that he loved her more than life, and that no man should take her from him while he lived. He was older, he reflected, and Evelyn still possessed a glorious beauty that time had touched with scarcely perceptible fingers. This Forbes Nathan was young too, younger than Evelyn. Was that the attraction? Did she turn to youth when she felt her own youth gently slipping from her? Or was it merely the insistent urge of propinquity? They were rehearsing The Sorrowful Lady, which would open on Broadway within the week. A curious, foreign play, with tricky barbed lines and smouldering love scenes. Damnable, insidious love scenes, he had thought them, as he watched from the empty darkness of the theatre. He recalled the comment of the stage manager, who shook his head at the conclusion of the third act. Nathan, you'll have to play the part older or Evelyn will have to make up younger, a lot younger. As it is, the thing isn't balanced. I'm afraid it won't get by. There had been a short silence. Then Evelyn had spoken, softly, with compelling vibrance in her voice, never dreaming of the hurt she had sent across the footlights into the heart of the man sitting there in the echoing darkness. You need not worry about that, Mr. Butler. I am sure we will do the love scenes realistically you want love and laughter evelyn do you think that i do not love you don't you think we have been happy together she caught a note that disguised as it was stirred the quick sympathy of her heart oh larry dear i know that you love me you have been so wonderful about everything. It's because I trust your love for me that I am not afraid to tell you that I love Forbes Nathan. Love him with every breath, every heartbeat of my existence. Larry, I know it hurts you to hear me say that, but I can't be anything but honest with you. I would rather hurt you than shame you. I'm asking you to let me go, to divorce me or let me get a divorce. I want to marry him. Larry, you've never heard me say that about any other man, have you? Please let me go, Larry. I can't live without him. Lawrence Danvers moved mechanically to the tiled fireplace. He took a cigarette from a brass container and lighted it with steady, unshaken fingers. Evelyn, you have a rather unique position in the theatrical world. There has never been the slightest rumor of anything ugly connected with your name. If you will look over the letters from young girls and their mothers, you will realize what an ideal you have made yourself. You know the laws of New York State. A divorce can be obtained in only one way a most unpleasant, filthy way. Are you willing to smirch yourself, or have me smirch myself for you to gratify this love? His fingers were wet upon the flimsy paper of the cigarette. He could not bring himself to look at her. Why, she was clean, so meticulous in her person, her mind, her manner of life. He could not visualise her plunging through the mud to be lifted upon the unstable pinnacle of passion. Ah, what they would say about her! They would strip her bare and run her through and through with all the long-suppressed delight and jealousy of little evil minds. He heard her sigh, ever so faintly. Yes, Larry, I will go through. Even that. The cigarette dropped out of his hand. He watched it boring a brown hole in the rug before he bent down to flick it into the fireplace. Time. That was the one hope left to him. Time had been his ally before. A day, a week, a month at most. And Evelyn had come to him with guileless, amused, unshadowed eyes, 
like a child of twelve who has found momentary delight in a baby's rattle, saying, Ah, oh, Larry, wasn't it funny that I should have liked that man? Why, really, he's, oh, well, anyhow, he's not you. Thank heaven, Larry, you aren't the jealous sort. But now, he wondered. There was a different quality in her tone, in her look. For the first time, he was afraid, weakly, terribly afraid. To his lawyer went Lawrence Danvers the following day. His tall form seemed bent as if pressed down by an invisible weight. His face suddenly looked old and haggard. Friend, I want the facts about this man, Forbes, Nathan. If it takes a whole detective bureau to get them, I've seen him, and I don't like his face. He's too smooth, too silky. I may have to let Evelyn go, but I'm damned if I'll let her go to anyone who is less worthy of her than I am. Frederick Simons, an old personal friend, chuckled a little. A long arm of coincidence is on the job, Larry. Here's an evening paper. Read it for yourself. He thrust the lurid evening star into the hands of Lawrence Danvers, who sat silent, reading the latest scandal of the day, which involved a notorious roadhouse, a chorus girl of doubtful repute, and Forbes Nathan, the heavy lover, they dubbed him, and there was much facetious comment upon the length and quality of his kisses. Utter nausea and supreme relief spun round and round in Lawrence Danvers's mind like the red and black of a roulette wheel. He rose, after a long interval, the pallor of his face somewhat dissipated, his eyes no longer sick and beaten. Thanks, old man. I guess this finishes things nicely. Frederick Simons put out his hand. If there's anything I can do, Larry, anything at all, I hope you'll call on me. Yes, thanks. I'll remember. They shook hands briefly. Evelyn was not there when he returned to the luxurious remoteness of the Gramercy Park apartment. In something resembling a panic, he telephoned the theatre. Supposing the disillusionment, the ugly revelation had overwhelmed her? The nonchalant theatre doorman who answered his telephone call had no information to offer. They rehearsed until six o'clock, Mr. Danvers. Yes, Nathan was here. I can't say when Miss Lorraine left the theatre. I came on duty just a few minutes ago. Sure, I'll have her call the house if she comes back. It was almost eleven when he heard her key turn in the lock. With a quick movement, he swept into the fireplace a pile of cigarette stubs, bent, twisted things, with the tips scarcely blackened. He made a feint of putting aside a magazine. He knew, even before she spoke, that she had seen, or heard, the story. There was no colour in her face, and her dark eyes were stretched unnaturally wide. Larry, have you read this? She held out a crumpled copy of the Evening Star. Yes, I have. In one way, Evelyn, I am deeply sorry. In another, of course, you will understand how I can be very glad. The colour flooded suddenly into her face. Glad? What do you mean? Do you think that this makes any difference in my love for him? The difference... If any, is that I love him more. These lies set on him by his enemies, like a pack of snarling dogs, do you think they matter to me? I tell you, my love is big, big. Nothing in the world can change it. If I must go to him through the mud, I'll go. I am not afraid of scorn. I am not afraid of slander. I will make the world realize what love is. Yes, the world that now condemns will bow its head in acknowledgment of the sacredness of our wonderful love. Lawrence Danvers heard the tempestuous slamming of her door. He stood motionless, groping in a thick cloud of unreality. He had lost... What was it she had said? I want love. Love and laughter. <laughs> In that next week he recalled more than once the statement made by some learned chatterer. He 
But if time ceased to move, we all would go speedily mad, either of boredom, ecstasy, or horror. The prosaic realities of life were all about him. The perfectly served meals, the business routine, calling at the theatre for his wife after rehearsals, and, at the end, there loomed the monstrous shadow of a blight. His mind kept turning upon it desperately like a squirrel upon a wheel. It was a totally unrelated incident that gave him a faint hope, vague as a light in a fog, but as welcome. A woman caught in a traffic jam, pulled from under a truck, cut and bleeding. He saw her wan, blood-streaked face as someone picked her up. He heard her say faintly, querulously, Has anyone a powder puff? Even through the heavy mist of his own misery, he caught the sardonic humour of the situation. A broken head and a powder puff, the eternal feminine that braves a burglar and screams at a mouse. The first night of the sorrowful lady approached. Evelyn had said to him, Please, Larry, don't come. It's going to hurt you, and I don't want to wound you any more than I have. That I must. I have put Forbes off until after tonight. I must think only of my work. But afterwards... Her eyes fell before his steady, deliberately impersonal glance. Oh, don't mind me. I wouldn't think of missing a first night. And there's just the possibility that you may want me to bring you home. Afterwards. You look awfully fagged, my dear. Haven't the rehearsals been going well? I'm not so sure. It's such a queer kind of a play. We're just a little fearful as to how it will go over. The third act love scene? He asked, smiling slightly. She flushed at his tone. We're not afraid of that. Forbes and I are. She stopped, suddenly ashamed. The grayness of his face was more than she could bear. Now he sat in the orchestra aisle seat, cold and tense. The first and second acts had come and gone, to the accompaniment of rather cautious applause. The audience was very evidently reserving its final decision for the third and last act. He heard murmurs of conversation about him, criticisms for the type of play, whispers of, Isn't that Forbes Nathan, who is mixed up in the roadhouse scandal? The one they call the heavy lover? and enthusiastic tributes to the charm and beauty of Evelyn Lorraine. Isn't she beautiful? How old is she? As old as that? Well, anyway, she's wonderful. Only, it's a queer part, don't you think? I don't know whether the play is supposed to be taken seriously or not. These foreign plays, aren't they odd? The curtain rose on the third act, and Evelyn Lorraine, as the sorrowful lady for whom the play was named, swept into her final tempestuous scenes with the man for whom, as in real life, she was willing to sacrifice her security, her honour. Ron Danvers felt the tension of the actors on the other side of the footlights. All were nervous with the exception of Evelyn Lorraine. She was superb. I give you my life, my happiness, my sorrow. Ah. The ringing glory of her voice was like the tolling of a death knell in the heart of the man who sat there in the darkness. Take all of me, do with me as you will, and if you crush me and leave me but a husk, the shell of me will smile on because of the inner rapture that once was mine. I love you, I love you. What else matters? See? I am yours, now and forever. She waited, passionately proud in her surrender. He caught at him fiercely, and their lips met in a long, passionate kiss. For the barest instant, a tense silence. And then, from somewhere far back in the absorbed intensity of the darkened theatre, there came a loud, derisive, Smack! It cracked like a bullet in the strained attention. A gasp, a shudder of nervous giggles, an explosive crackle of laughter, and the theatre rocked with that peculiar merriment which is half amusement and half relief from taut nerves. The heavy lover! <laughs> the heavy lover! Someone said it half aloud, 
and the laughter became hysterical. There were the smacks, kissing sounds, and loud, derisive sighs. Upon the stage, Forbes, Nathan, and Evelyn Lorraine clung startled in the frantic, forgetful embrace which seemed now not passionate, but merely ridiculous. Ron Stanford saw his wife wrench herself out of her stage lover's arms. Her eyes were blazing, incredulous, shamed. She passed her hand over her eyes, across her mouth. Forbes and Nathan took a quick, appealing step toward her, but she was looking at him as if he had accosted her insolently upon the street. She flung up her head and spoke a short, sharp word that the playwright had never written. Four. Lawrence Danvers was waiting for her at the stage door that night. She came out quickly, almost stumbling against him. She looked at him with eyes that slowly became aware of his existence, then filled with helpless tears. Her hands went out to him gropingly. Take me home. Lawrence Danvers thought of many things that night when his wife lay within the protecting circle of his arms like a weary, heartsick child. He thought of the feminine illogicality of mind which will laugh at disgrace and be disgraced by laughter. He thought of Frederick Simons, who had given rich proof of his friendship by the saying of one word, and the thought that went with him into slumber was that Evelyn Lorraine should never know that he himself had given her the two things she craved from another, love and laughter. End of Love and Laughter The Tale of Johnny Townmouse by Beatrix Potter of Dramatic Readings Seen in Story Collection, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrator, read by Carolyn Seifarth. Johnny Townmouse, read by M. Wee. Timmy Willie, read by Rich Brown. Cook, read by Nora Nelson. Johnny Townmouse was born in a cupboard. Timmy Willie was born in a garden. Timmy Willie was a little country mouse who went to town by mistake in a hamper. The gardener sent vegetables to town once a week by carrier. He packed them in a big hamper. The gardener left the hamper by the garden gate so that the carrier could pick it up when he passed. Timmy Willie crept in through a hole in the wicker work, and after eating some peas, Timmy Willie fell fast asleep. He awoke in a fright while the hamper was being lifted into the carrier's cart. Then there was a jolting and a clattering of horses' feet. Other packages were thrown in. For miles and miles, jolt, 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 and Timmy Willie trembled amongst the jumbled-up vegetables. At last the cart stopped at a house, where the hamper was taken out, carried in, and set down. The cook gave the carrier sixpence, the back door banged, and the cart rumbled away. But there was no quiet. There seemed to be hundreds of carts passing. Dogs barked, boys whistled in the street, the cook laughed, the parlor maid ran up and down stairs, and a canary sang like a steam engine. Timmy Willie, who had lived all his life in a garden, was almost frightened to death. Presently, the cook opened the hamper and began to unpack the vegetables. Out sprang the terrified Timmy Willie. Up jumped the cook on a chair, exclaiming, A mouse! A mouse! Call a cat! Fetch me the poker, Sarah! Timmy Willie did not wait for Sarah with the poker. He rushed along the skirting board till he came to a little hole, and in he popped. He dropped half a foot and crashed into the middle of a mouse dinner party, breaking three glasses. Who in the world is this? inquired Johnny Town Mouse, but after the first exclamation of surprise, he instantly recovered his manners. With the utmost politeness, he introduced Timmy Willie to nine other mice, all with long tails and white neckties. Timmy Willie's own tail was insignificant. 
Johnny Town Mouse and his friends noticed it, but they were too well bred to make personal remarks. Only one of them asked Timmy Willie if he had ever been in a trap. The dinner was eight courses, not much of anything, but truly elegant. All the dishes were unknown to Timmy Willie, who would have been a little afraid of tasting them. Only he was very hungry and very anxious to behave with company manners. The continual noise upstairs made him so nervous that he dropped a plate. Never mind, they don't belong to us, said Johnny. Why don't those youngsters come back with the dessert? It should be explained that two young mice, who were waiting on the others, went skirmishing upstairs to the kitchen between courses. Several times they had come tumbling in, squeaking and laughing. Timmy Willie learnt with horror that they were being chased by the cat. His appetite failed. He felt faint. Try some jelly, said Johnny Town Mouse. No. Would you rather go to bed? I will show you a most comfortable sofa pillow. The sofa pillow had a hole in it. Johnny Town Mouse quite honestly recommended it as the best bed kept exclusively for visitors. But the sofa smelt of cat. Timmy Willie preferred to spend a miserable night under the fender. It was just the same next day. An excellent breakfast was provided for mice accustomed to eat bacon, but Timmy Willie had been reared on roots and salad. Johnny Town Mouse and his friends racketed about under the floors and came boldly out all over the house in the evening. One particularly loud crash had been caused by Sarah tumbling downstairs with the tea tray. There were crumbs and sugar and smears of jam to be collected, in spite of the cat. Timmy Willie longed to be at home in his peaceful nest in a sunny bank. The food disagreed with him. The noise prevented him from sleeping. In a few days, he grew so thin that Johnny Town Mouse noticed it and questioned him. He listened to Timmy Willie's story and inquired about the garden. It sounds rather a dull place. What do you do when it rains? When it rains, I sit in my little sandy burrow and shell corn and seeds from my autumn store. I peep out at the throstles and blackbirds on the lawn and my friend Cock Robin. And when the sun comes out again, you should see my garden and the flowers roses and pinks and pansies no noise except the birds and bees and the lambs in the meadows there goes that cat again exclaimed johnny town mouse when they had taken refuge in the coal cellar he resumed the conversation i confess i am a little disappointed we have endeavoured to entertain you timothy william Oh, yes, yes, you have been most kind, but I do feel so ill, said Timmy Willie. It may be that your teeth and digestion are unaccustomed to our food. Perhaps it might be wiser for you to return in the hamper. Oh, oh, cried Timmy Willie. Why, of course for the matter of that we could have sent you back last week said johnny rather huffily did you not know that the hamper goes back empty on saturdays so timmy willie said good-bye to his new friends and hid in the hamper with a crumb of cake and a withered cabbage leaf and after much jolting he was set down safely in his own garden Sometimes on Saturdays he went to look at the hamper lying by the gate, but he knew better than to get in again. And nobody got out, though Johnny Town Mouse had half promised a visit. The winter passed, the sun came out again, Timmy Willie sat by his burrow warming his little fur coat and sniffing the smell of violets and spring grass. He had nearly forgotten his visit to town, 
when up the sandy path all spick and span with a brown leather bag came johnny town mouse timmy willie received him with open arms you have come at the best time of all the year we will have herb pudding and sit in the sun it is a little damp said johnny town mouse who was carrying his tail under his arm out of the mud what is that fearful noise he started violently that said timmy willie that is only a cow i will beg a little milk they are quite harmless unless they happen to lie down upon you how are all our friends johnny's account was rather middling he explained why he was paying his visit so early in the season the family had gone to the seaside for easter the cook was doing spring cleaning on board wages with particular instructions to clear out the mice there were four kittens and the cat had killed the canary they say we did it but i know better said johnny town mouse whatever is that fearful racket that is only the lawnmower i will fetch some of the grass clippings presently to make your bed i am sure you had better settle in the country johnny mm, we shall see by tuesday week the hamper is stopped while they are at the seaside i am sure you will never want to live in town again said timmy willie but he did he went back in the very next hamper of vegetables he said it was too quiet one place suits one person another place suits another person for my part i prefer to live in the country like timmy willie end of the tale of johnny town mouse The Open Window by Saki Dramatic Reading Scene and Story Collection, Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrator, read by Carolyn Seifarth Vera, read by Sonia Mr. Nuttall's Sister Read by Agnes Robert Bear. Mr. Frampton Nuttall. Read by Todd. Mrs. Sappleton. Read by Wendy Katzhiller. Mr. Sappleton. Read by Beeswax Candle. Ronnie. Read by Greg Giordano. My aunt will be down presently, Mr. Nuttall, said a very self possessed young lady of fifteen. In the meantime, you must try and put up with me. Frampton Nuttall endeavoured to say the correct something which should duly flatter the niece of the moment, without unduly discounting the aunt that was to come. Privately, he doubted more than ever whether these formal visits on a succession of total strangers would do much toward helping the nerve cure which he was supposed to be undergoing. I know how it will be his sister had said when he was preparing to migrate to this rural retreat you will bury yourself down there and not speak to a living soul and your nerves will be worse than ever from moping i shall just give you letters of introduction to all the people i know there some of them as far as i can remember were quite nice frampton wondered whether Mrs. Sappleton, the lady to whom he was presenting one of the letters of introduction, came into the nice division. "'Do you know many of the people around here?' asked the niece, when she judged that they had had sufficient silent communion. "'Hardly a soul,' said Frampton. "'My sister was staying here, at the rectory, you know, some four years ago.' and she gave me letters of introduction to some of the people here he made the last statement in a tone of distinct regret then you know practically nothing about my aunt pursued the self-possessed young lady only her name and address admitted the caller 
He was wondering whether Mrs. Sappleton was in the married or widowed state. An undefinable something about the room seemed to suggest masculine habitation. Her great tragedy happened just three years ago, said the child. That would be since your sister's time. Her tragedy? asked Frampton. Somehow, in this restful country spot, tragedies seemed out of place. You may wonder why we keep that window wide open on an October afternoon, said the niece, indicating a large French window that opened onto a lawn. It is quite warm for the time of year, said Frampton. But has that window got anything to do with the tragedy? Out through that window, three years ago to a day, her husband and her two young brothers went off for their day's shooting. They never came back. In crossing the moor to their favorite snipe-shooting ground, they were all three engulfed in a treacherous piece of bog. It had been that dreadful wet summer, you know, and places that were safe in other years gave way suddenly without warning. Their bodies were never recovered. That was the dreadful part of it. Here the child's voice lost its self-possessed note and became falteringly human. Poor aunt always thinks that they will come back some day, they and the little brown spaniel that was lost with them, and walk in at that window just as they used to do. That is why the window is kept open every evening till it is quite dusk. Poor dear aunt. She has often told me how they went out, her husband with his white waterproof coat over his arm, and Ronnie, her youngest brother, singing, Bertie, why do you bound? As he always did to tease her, because she said it got on her nerves. Do you know, sometimes on still, quiet evenings like this, I almost get a creepy feeling that they will all walk in through that window. She broke off with a little shudder. It was a relief to Frampton when the aunt bustled into the room with a whirl of apologies for being late in making her appearance. I hope Vera has been amusing you, she said. She has been very interesting, said Frampton. I hope you don't mind the open window, said Mrs. Sappleton briskly. My husband and brothers will be home directly from shooting, and they always come in this way. They've been out for snipe in the marshes today, so they'll make a fine mess over my poor carpets. So like you men folk, isn't it? She rattled on cheerfully about the shooting and the scarcity of birds and the prospects for duck in the winter. To Frampton it was all purely horrible. He made a desperate but only partially successful effort to turn the talk onto a less ghastly topic. He was conscious that his hostess was giving him only a fragment of her attention, and her eyes were constantly straying past him to the open window and the lawn beyond. It was certainly an unfortunate coincidence that he should have paid his visit on this tragic anniversary. The doctors agree in ordering me complete rest, an absence of mental excitement, an avoidance of anything in the nature of violent physical exercise, announced Frampton who labored under the tolerably widespread delusion that total strangers and chance acquaintances are hungry for the least detail of one's ailments and infirmities, their cause and cure. On the matter of diet, they are not so much in agreement, he continued. No, said Mrs. Sappleton, in a voice which only replaced a yawn at the last moment. Then she suddenly brightened into alert attention, but not to what Frampton was saying. Here they are at last, she cried, just in time for tea, and don't they look as if they were muddy up to the eyes? Frampton shivered slightly and turned toward the niece with a look intended to convey sympathetic comprehension. The child was staring out through the open window with dazed horror in her eyes. In a chill shock of nameless fear, Frampton swung round in his seat and looked in the same direction. In the deepening twilight, three figures were walking across the lawn toward the window. 
They all carried guns under their arms, and one of them was additionally burdened with a white coat hung over his shoulders. A tired brown spaniel kept close at their heels. Noiselessly they neared the house, and then a hoarse young voice chanted out of the dusk. I said, Bertie, why do you bound? Frampton grabbed wildly at his stick and hat. The hall door, the gravel drive, and the front gate were dimly noted stages in his headlong retreat. A cyclist coming along the road had to run into the hedge to avoid an imminent collision. Here we are, my dear, said the bearer of the white Macintosh, coming in through the window. Fairly muddy, but most of it's dry. Who was that who bolted out as we came up? A most extraordinary man, a Mr. Nuttall, said Mrs. Sappleton. Could only talk about his illnesses and dashed off without a word of goodbye or apology when you arrived. One would think he had seen a ghost. I expect it was the Spaniel, said the niece calmly. He told me he had a horror of dogs. He was once hunted into a cemetery somewhere on the banks of the Ganges, by a pack of pariah dogs and had to spend the night in a newly dug grave with the creatures snarling and grinning and foaming just above him enough to make anyone lose their nerve romance at short notice was her specialty end of the open window end of dramatic reading scene and story collection volume four